I know what you're thinking. Yes, this podcast is really three hours long. Yes, we go a million miles an hour. And I'm sorry this was recorded last July. This episode will be just like the Council's episode 11. The same kind of style, but obviously we go for longer. So we have a new guy with us. Uh, I don't think I'm supposed to share his name. Found him through Instagram. Got him to show up. And I think by the end of it, he was very pleased. So there's just a couple big questions that we answer, uh, talk about for most of the time. Obviously, we get into um, a lot of detail on very specific laws, lots of different ones. So the big one was, how should we respond to today's unlawful taxes? Uh, What does the priesthood look like today? And also talking about what is milk versus meat. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. Dude, it's, how crazy is it that I was just thinking, you know, like, connect through Instagram. Yeah. You know, I think that's so cool. But, like, I remember the first time that I ever connected with somebody that I had been emailing with online. It was really strange. Yeah. And that was, like, 2006. And now it's, like, it's super I've done it before yeah. so many times. It's just, like, you forget, like... That they're real people behind the screen, and yeah. then you're like, wait, no, they're real people behind the screen. So y'all didn't know each other at all before Instagram, right? No, this is the first time we've ever met. No, nice. We've never met before. So. How yeah. long have y'all been chatting? Well, on Six and off months chatting or, a year or something. A few months, nice. something like that. Yeah. I don't even. Did we? Uh, I think I saw you on Whiskey's page. That probably was the first place. I, I post think. on there occasionally. Yeah, I, I should I was do like, it more because there's where I find a lot of. People. Yeah, I was going through the comments. I was like, theocracy. Wait, what? Like, yeah. how does this fit into like what whiskey's talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, this is crazy. I, cause, well, it's like, how long do you, how long do you have to talk about this? <laughs> yeah, well, because I mean, most people on that page are you know a religious mm-hmm. or you know very anti everything and like all Christianity I'd heard my whole life was. Boomer neocon Christianity. Mm-hmm. So are you just exploring the Old Testament thing, or are you? Uh, I mean, I'm interested. It? I I mean, I've read through the whole Bible, and I'm on my second time through right now. So I I have an understanding of the Old Testament. Um, I just don't understand how it applies into our society yeah. and our culture today. You know, it's it's really interesting, and I have conversations with people about it. That's all I want to talk about anymore. Yeah, that's like all I think about. Yeah. So what are, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Pick a topic. <laughs> <laughs> I so, might not have them on some of them that I haven't encountered before, but yeah, some of the more common ones, like I talk about and have discussions with people all the time. So should we institute parts of you know Levitical law through Deuteronomy, like in our society, or do we look to them for guidance? And creating our own interpretations of them, or what do you think? So where I'm at right now, and I'm on a journey, 
um, where I'm at right now is that we should seek to obey them in our own lives, and that would cause other people around us to sort of turn their heads and examine the fruits of that. Okay. So this is the result of thinking this way and wanting to obey these kinds of laws. Here are how those people behave. Here are how their lives turn out. Here are the consequences of those actions. The result. Let the results sort of speak speak for themselves. Okay. So when you try to, so do you try to follow like all six hundred? Was it six hundred thirteen? I don't know. They're like traditionally, it's six hundred and thirteen yeah. or whatever. But a lot of them are cut out because of the sacrifice laws. <laughs> yeah. There's the and well, a lot of those things they just look different today. Okay. Like you are familiar with the whole temple sacrifices yes. and yeah. all that stuff? Yeah. We still have a form of that today, which is better than what they used to have. Okay. So, like in the new covenant, all believers are priests. Yeah. We're also living stones, like, of the temple. Okay. And then we're also the sacrifice itself. We are. Oh, well, I think we offer our bodies as living sacrifices. Okay. So all the works that I do today, it's for God. Yeah. Like we and so I don't have pick to pick up our cross daily. And mm-hmm. Follow. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. So my life is a sacrifice to God, and I have been made acceptable by Christ. Yeah, Christ made me clean, so now I can be seen as perfect in the eyes of God. And so now all the work that I do is considered righteous and holy and acceptable. Yeah, like an offering before God that, mm-hmm. that He doesn't need a pleasing, a pleasing yeah. aroma. Yeah, yeah, like something that He appreciates. Fruits of our salvation essentially I would say it's not that he needs it it's that unbelievers need it okay like they need to see the difference in our they need lives. to see a difference in our lives and also um, the way that I think of my daily life is I'm going out and solving problems that weren't caused by me yeah. and even in business like you see somebody that has a need that needs gas they've got a problem and it's not my fault that they need gas yeah. in their car. But I can, as a business owner, go out and make a gas station and solve those kinds of problems for people. So it's not necessarily a sin problem per se, but it's a problem. There's a need that needs to be fulfilled. And it's and it's not something that I need, it's something that somebody else needs. Okay. So I know this is the go-to one that everybody always talks about, but pork, shellfish... We can't eat anything unclean. All foods have been made clean, though. So yeah. good luck trying to find something unclean to eat. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at, too. And Paul's very specific about that. And so I was just... Some people try to say, like, oh, I still follow the Ten Commandments, so I need to follow that. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not sure that really applies. <laughs> there is... Um, there's a couple of times... There's once in Acts... Remember where Peter has the vision, the sheep comes down yeah. three times with all the unclean animals. God yeah. says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. Yeah. And then that happens again, and it happens a third time. And then after the vision, Peter's sitting there thinking, what in the world does this mean? And then all of a sudden, hey, Peter, will you come share the gospel with the Gentiles? Yeah. There are some people here to collect to collect you and bring you with them and then you go and I think it was the centurion's house somebody's but yeah his first thought would have been that the Gentiles were clean I can't go mm-hmm. yeah um, yeah it's like these. this is not God is not for the Gentiles like they have to be circumcised and yeah. be proselytized and all this stuff to be brought into the faith and then well and as soon and then Peter recounted this later in discussions and recorded in the book of Acts where he shares how the Holy Spirit immediately came down and they started speaking in tongues saying like they're fully in the covenant just like we are and they hadn't been keeping any of the laws it's the instant they heard this they became clean as far as God is concerned and that was very different news to everybody that Peter told that story to and then Mark seven thirteen. Where it's not what goes into the body. Yeah. Comes out. Mm-hmm. Mark seven is just like I don't know. It's so obvious that I, I don't. I still don't understand yeah. how. Well, the way that most people I think think of it is that like, well, we don't have to do anything that the the Old Testament says unless it's expressly expressly repeated in the New Testament. 
Okay. So, like, we're told in the New Testament that you can't steal and murder and sexual yeah. immorality is wrong and all this stuff. So but Jesus then, didn't directly, like, refer to, or even the apostles didn't directly refer to something. A specific commandment, yeah. then it's, then you assume that it's gone. Yeah. Which I don't, I don't agree with. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't say that anywhere. That's just kind of like an inference, mm -hmm. you know. Well, and then bestiality is not mentioned in the New Testament. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So can we, can we do that with animals now? I don't know any believer that would say yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. So my <laughs> my take is that I assume that everything applies unless we're specifically told that it's been changed. Okay. So what are some things from the Old Testament that you think still apply? Just, I guess we can go category by category. And I know this isn't like a biblical distinction, but people often make the distinction of, you know, the moral, the civil, and the, the ceremonial. ceremonial law. So obviously Christ fulfilled the mm -hmm. sacrifice so we don't have to, you know, cut goats in half and walk for them. Right. Um, when we offer up our word, you know. Um, now the moral and civil mm -hmm. that's where I'm interested in. right because I know your your name is theocrat like you're obviously mm -hmm. for the idea of a theocracy <laughs> well we're living in one right now it's just a question of who's which God's law okay explain explain um so like most people now agree that the state can make up whatever laws that it wants yeah, there's a there's a quote from R.J. Rushing that says, um, "If when you find a society's source of law, you have found its God." Okay. Yeah, I mean, you look at the so in Christianity, where law comes from is God. God gives the law. In the United States, the law comes from Congress. Yeah. Or, so it's sort of a humanist religion. Yeah, I would agree. It's like borderline. I mean, maybe it is idolatry. Like we're idolizing our own ability to govern ourselves. So we think that we can create rules and create a utopia, essentially. And that's where if I we just pass yeah. enough laws, then that's most people's first thought is like, well, there just ought to be a law. And our problem is that we just don't have enough of them yet. Yeah. What is it, like 75,000 pages per year? Yeah. yeah. Way more than in the Bible. It's <laughs> unreal. Thank you. You couldn't spend an entire lifetime reading everything. It's like when people Tax say, code. when people say, why do you think that we should still follow the Old Testament laws? Because there's so many that we can't even keep track. And then I'm like, well, oh, what can yeah. I go with today? <laughs> Let's pause real quick. Yeah. Let's read the tax code, federal tax code, right. and see where we get. <laughs> Somebody was saying that the power of a lawyer is in the ambiguity of the law. <laughs> I thought that was a really good quote. Yeah. If the yeah. law is super simple and everybody understands it, like, what do you need lawyers for? Exactly. <laughs> it's the gray area. They get paid huge bucks to debate over super ambiguous things. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, their job is to interpret things that nobody really has a final say on what it means. And courts rule different and oppose each other constantly. It's just confusing. Like, I, I just genuinely am terrified of someone somehow entering the legal system. <laughs> I'm like, because I'll never come everybody, out. <laughs> everybody is. That's the, whole, that's the whole threat of the government, is that yeah. everybody lives in fear of, somebody could accuse me of, uh, I've, and I've seen this happen with, like, homeschooling families. The grandparents don't like that the parents are homeschooling their kids, and so they'll call CPS no. and have the kids... And the grandparents will have the children taken away from the grandkids taken away from from their kids. Oh my gosh! And like, that's awful. Two years later, they finally come back to their parents. It's like, yeah, it happens. The the homeschool legal defense association deals with that kind of stuff all the time. It's so bad because it's so slow. Like I was involved in like a case recently. Was, well, I didn't actually get to testify because the prosecutors entire case was resting on my testimony. I told him I was flying out the next day and that I couldn't come back the next day. He was like, but can you come back the next day? I was like, no. So then he tossed the case. But it's so brutally slow. I thought it was going to be from like 8 to 10. No. I, I left at like 3.30 because they 
called the case because they weren't going to finish by five. This is terrible. I can't imagine being just consumed in a lawsuit. I mean, yeah. So you did you did do something in that case? Well, I was supposed to. So I was a witness to someone running a flashing yellow, and there was obviously a car coming in their direction, and it was just clear as day that it was going to be a wreck. You know, boom, T-bone. So I just like ran out to make sure like both people were okay. Um, and long story short, like I called 911, like helped the lady in the ambulance, um, and then I get a call from the prosecutor's office, like asking me to testify in the case. Now I wasn't subpoenaed, but I was coming to Fort Worth anyways because I was flying out to Panama City Beach for the weekend. So I was like, why not? I'll just go up a day early. I was like, this will be cool. I'll get to take part in. I'll get to see how the sausage is made. Yeah, and no sausage was made. They had all the ingredients, and then they had all kinds of other ingredients for other kinds of meals. And, you know, they just dismiss cases. They dismiss, like, 30 cases. You know, people just plead not guilty because they don't have time to go through them all. Not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. So I'm like, what's the point of having these laws in the first place? If they get to, they have 40 cases, they get to choose two, and one of them has to get tossed out because... It's just absurd. So, uh, yeah, I thought it was going to be fun getting to be a part. Like, doing mock trial in high school. I was like, oh, this will be cool. Yeah. Great job. No, it was terrible, and now I'm terrified of the legal system. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if somebody really was getting in trouble, they probably could, because it's just that many laws that people don't know about. You just throw out an accusation. And that's one thing that I think that the American legal system could greatly benefit from, from biblical law. Yeah. You can't, if you are throwing out an accusation against somebody... You're on the hook, or if you're found to be lying, then you get the penalty of what you're accusing somebody. Yeah, absolutely. That would I can't believe that would, that's not the reality. That would throw out people would people would govern themselves and never bring ninety five percent of like. Can you yeah. imagine trying to sue somebody for like a hundred million dollars, and if you're found to be wrong, you owe a hundred million dollars to the to the person that you're yeah, suing, not the government. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, they'd probably way lower that. And it's because it's a high, like, even in civil court, you would have to prove, like, you know, uh, preponderance of evidence, 51% that they did it. And that's a hard standard to meet, mm-hmm. you know. So it's like, I think I, that would be awesome, but I don't know why it's not a thing. Yeah. You know, I'm, the argument that I hear at, from people is that, well, people would be too scared to ever say anything. Like, what if somebody, what, what if five people all saw a murder happen? And they all go and they testify. If they're found to be lying, yeah, all five of those people would be executed or life in prison or whatever. Then I think most of those people would just not say anything. If there's any kind of risk, whatever. Yeah. But if they genuinely saw what happened and had the conviction to testify, to help whoever was the family of whoever was murdered, you know, put this person away or put him down, whatever, you know, however you want to deal with it, right. they would have no reason not to. Right. And they'd have so. to have a strong sense of moral duty, also, mm-hmm. which would have come from all Yeah, right. right which our culture doesn't have. And so yeah. the question is, how do you get that back and into, just, a, into an entire culture? And that's and so, it's like we don't even have a unified culture, though. That's the thing that's hard, is it's like we have all of these little miniature federations within the continental United States. And, and even from county to county and city, yeah. city, city ordinances, county ordinances. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't. I honestly don't know much about that. Like, I know more about the relationship between federal and states, but the you know relationship between municipalities and the state, I, I don't. Really know. I don't know how that works either. I, mean, so I probably easy. should. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's like the same relationship, like or it's like how like what is involved in incorporating a city. I think you literally have to. Isn't it like? You basically pay a fee to the state, basically, and you're given the you, you're allowed to name a town. You have your population limit and your something like lines. that. Yeah, I don't know how. I yeah. have no idea how that works. I know people do it, obviously. Yeah, he's got those little towns with like 80 people in West Texas. <laughs> hey, we should incorporate. Yeah, let's do it. Can our entire town afford to pay the fee to become a city? I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. I don't know much about politics. I've, I've tried to just totally steer clear of that until, well, yeah. until this Old Testament study because it really has to get into politics. Really? Politics and religion are the same thing. <laughs> it's, yeah. I know. I tried. I was really into politics in my BC days. Um, BC? Before Christ. Before I came okay. to Christ. Um, and then I 
kind of viewed it as an idol for a while. Like I would definitely get sucked into and have more passion towards that than towards Christ. So I kind of, I don't want to say gave it up, but a lot less focus. And now I've been, over like the last year, like six months, I've been really sucked into it again because I realized they are completely intertwined. You can't separate one from the other. Like we cannot operate, you know, outside of politics because it directly affects us and everything we do. Yeah. So That's why I tend to focus a lot more on the anarcho-capitalist side of things because yeah. I think they have a lot of things right. They sort of have a basis and like I can come in and and help answer questions that they may be thinking about. Like yeah. I, there was one the other day where I said, um, I don't know if you follow Oregon ANCAP. I don't, I don't know. I unfollowed a lot of the ANCAP accounts because they just got kind of annoying. They are kind of annoying. They it's tend like, to be a lot younger yeah. kids. Um, and it's like they, they just completely them. idolize like capitalism. And I'm like, capitalism is just the exchange of goods with a medium in between. Like it's not it's literally just a word that means human interaction and trading. So it's like, why well, so, I just call it anarchy? <laughs> yeah, this guy, um, and well, I don't necessarily agree with the term anarchy, but I know what they mean by it. Um, so somebody posted about the death penalty. Yeah. And I, I posted on there, I said, I support capital crimes being punished by community stoning. Yeah. That way, if the community disagrees, the state has no means to execute. That would be a necessary check on a judge's authority. Yeah. And I had one guy, I think, I don't think he's religious at all. He says, well, for once I agree with you. <laughs> really? And I'm like, yeah. Most he's, people are just taken aback by the thought of stoning yeah. someone. But that's, I remember you told me that one time. And I had never heard that perspective before. Like, obviously I knew stoning was a thing. Because I've read through the entire Old Testament. But I, I couldn't figure out what the significance of it well, was. Well, and the whole thing about, like, te- I think the state of Texas is one of the, one of the states that has capital punishment yeah. yeah they'll do lethal injection but they do like 10 a year or yeah something. and it's for people that did things 30 years ago yeah I wrote a research paper on lethal injection and it's just it's gotta go I mean that's a whole nother subject, and it's incredibly expensive and it's not yeah. reliable $250,000 per person just for the injection yeah more than yeah prison. wow yeah not even for the all the prison time leading up to them getting executed that's probably, probably millions, millions and millions of dollars, of tax dollars. yeah you know firing squad it's 50 cents for 308 rounds <laughs> like it sounds it sounds terrible but it's like and it also means like you can't take away from the moral perspective of it like we're not just like getting the rid of this person from society like we're setting down a cultural boundary saying, like, we do not accept this, and, like, we will bear the burden as society of killing other people to say that we will not put up with this. And if people want to make it a scientific thing, like, oh, we're just putting them to sleep. I don't think I sent it to you. I, I should send it to, I'll send the link to you. Um, there's, a, there's a Vox news story on YouTube about uh, the, the guy that was most recently executed by a firing squad. I don't think it, it's in it. It was like 2015 or 14, really? something like that. It was really recent. Yeah. And all of the family members of the guy, well, the guy opted for it. He's like, can I be executed yeah. by firing squad? He wanted to be. Yeah. And his family thought that it was ridiculous. The state said, okay. And his family was totally against the death penalty. But the people on the other side that were the family members of the murdered person yeah. You should listen to what they say. Really? I'll, it's I'll absolutely to it. fascinating. It's a inter- very interesting topic because lethal injection is like, it, it doesn't work a lot of the time. Like, because, they, so it's like three different chemicals. It's like a potassium override the heart, so it shuts down all the electrical voltage channels in the heart so it can't contract. And it's really interesting. So one of the chemicals, there's like a, it's very specific, and it was only manufactured two places in the world, in Europe, and there's one manufacturing plant in the U.S. Well, Europe boycotted and will not sell it to the U.S. anymore because they're against the death penalty. And that factor, that plant went out of business and shut down. So now the reason that they've been having all these botched lethal injections is because they're trying to substitute other chemicals to take its place. Hmm. That's you not how it works. It was? Um, so there's like the, there's the sedative, there's like the... Um, 
No, I don't know the name of it off the top of my head, but you know, there's the sedative, there's well, the it's multiple. Uh, numbing. It's like the first one put, yeah. makes you unconscious, the next one slows your heart, and the last one stops your heart, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's the last one's the potassium override. We can do that easily. I think it's the... Um, I want to say it's the, the numbing. It's not the uh, sedative, because, you know, people have awoken during the lethal injections because of they're using them. Either the sedative wore off too early, and they didn't have the numbing throughout their body, so they find it's extreme pain. You know, it's it's very barbaric, in my opinion. You know, I think it's you know I, I think it'd be interesting to talk about like the barbaric factor. Like a lot of people are going to say like, oh, we can never go back to stoning because it's like we're more civilized. Than that. Mm-hmm. That's the number one argument. Yeah. So Which yeah, is not what, an what, argument what at all. You, uh, it's like an opinion. <laughs> what, would you, what would you say? That? Well, I think it should be barbaric. Um, I was talking with a uh, group of guys last night and they were talking about how do you how do you stop younger teenagers from like playing with themselves essentially and having them be afraid of that and stop it and not do it and I said I, I said it in a joking manner but I, I mean this I said okay son you're 12 years old it's time to attend your first stoning for adultery Oh, that would be a uh, interesting. You've had to you've had your bar mitzvah. You're a man now. Come on. No, no, no. That that rock. Yeah. You think that, that would deter yeah, some things? Because the way that PTSD. lethal injections are done, they're done in private, where nobody yeah. sees it. Yeah. And it's secret, and it, nobody knows exactly when it happens, except maybe the family members. And it's like deliberately kept secret to where nobody has to think about it. So you think that? I think God's design was, you know, I want everybody to watch. No, I agree with that. Like, I agree with that from the, yes, I 100% agree with that. Where I may differ, so you think that, well, no, I don't want to say you think, because I know you're always referencing the scripture. You think that people should get the death penalty for masturbating? No, not masturbating. And you said playing with themselves. I but assuming like, that's what you were referring but, to. Yeah, well, yeah, that's what I'm referring to, but, like, the end, like result of that, like if you keep playing around yeah. sexually, eventually that will lead to yeah. adultery. That will make people at least think about it. No, and I think that's a really interesting, like dilemma we face here. It's like people say that we write our laws based on morality, and I'm like, that's not true because adultery is not illegal. It's terrible, but in the United States, adultery is not illegal. Mm-hmm. So, and a, uh, it's sort of something that people are left to sort of deal with on their own. Yeah. And work it out if you can, and if you can't, well, you can just get divorced and, yeah, just deal with it. And that's another thing, marriage, too, is, like, I, I, I'd like to hear your views on um, marriage. I don't think the state should be involved in marriage whatsoever. It's a covenant between It's a covenant between, it's a covenant between yeah. your, you, your spouse, and God. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't understand how the state somehow got sucked into that. Um, there's something to be said for the state being a records keeper. Okay. Like, because that, that's something that a private that private companies do. Okay. We've got a record of your marriage, but also there's there should be there should be witnesses of a marriage. Yeah. So there's something there's something for that too. More like the tax benefits and stuff like that. Like I don't understand how that. Is. That's something that's going to be, yeah, way down the road to change or do anything about. But yeah. it's like, in the here and now today, you can do, I mean, Texas recognizes common law marriage. To where you say that you're married in the state of Texas, it's like, okay. So that's, yeah, that's an interesting thing. I would, So obviously, like, divorce, like, should never be a thing in the eyes of God, except in the act of, um, you know, adultery outside of marriage, whatever. So my one of my mom's coworkers right now is actually going. She's going like he's going through like a brutal divorce, like two, over two hundred fifty thousand dollars in lawyers' fees because it's in custody over his daughter, and it's just it's really sad. Um, the thing it's just like the thing that scares me is so his wife basically completely masqueraded her true intentions when they got married. Like she pretended like she was interested in all the things he was interested in because she knew that she had a lot of. He's a great guy too. He's a follower. Like. And she just completely went along with that. They had a kid, and then I guess she got, I don't want to say got bored of him, but for whatever reason. Her just, purpose was completed, or yeah. whatever, yeah. So Ready she's to like, move I'm on done. the next thing. And, and he has, he can't do anything. Like, he had legally, 
he can't say like, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not giving you alimony. Like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. He can't say that. He can't say, you know, I don't know if you follow the page on Facebook. It's you know, unilateral divorce, unconstitutional. It's like he can't. He has no say. It's like she's able to separate from him and pull him into lawsuits. So, what point? Where I'm going with this is like, should Christians like move away from having their marriage recognized by the state? So that we're not saying that oh, you're going to have any backstop. Like this is between you, your you spouse. You can't go and God. to somebody else to give you a divorce. Exactly. Because I'm not going to let you out of it. Yeah. What do you? What are your thoughts on that? That would probably be my attitude. No. I don't even know. Can you be like married without getting the state involved? In Texas, Texas. you can. Texas recognizes common law marriage, but there. Are, okay. I'm not sure what all it makes more complicated and difficult but yeah. there are certain things like opening joint bank accounts which are uh, absolute pain to do um, I think ta- taxes are involved in it somehow Yeah, um, I'm not exactly sure but like my family is, would prefer the state not be involved in granting permission to get married um, but he did end up getting a Texas marriage license and his thinking was, it's going to make several of these things easier. Yeah. It makes getting, uh, like, updating passports easier. Like, all the stuff that you have to mess around with the state already, which it shouldn't be doing. Yeah. But it's like, there's all kinds of things that I'm willing, that I am that I have to mess with now that I wish I didn't have to. Yeah. yeah so it's like, I can, I can go ahead and play along. Okay. But that doesn't necessarily mean thing that it's right or legitimate. You're not necessarily endorsing it. You just no. don't really have... You can't operate mm-hmm. without... Because if it. I took that thing where... If I ha- if I forced myself to be perfectly consistent in that area, to where if I don't think that the state should be doing this, then I'm not going to pay for it. I'm not going to be involved with it or deal with it whatsoever. You can't do that. Yeah. It's not possible. The IRS will come take everything you have. Well, take your well and another thing, you can't drive on any roads. You can't drive on any roads. You can't use the post office because the government shouldn't be involved in those things. And the roads were, the vast majority of them, taken by eminent domain, so they're stolen property. You're driving yeah. on stolen property. Yeah, I know. It's deep. It goes It goes incredibly deep. deep. Like, that's that's why people, like, ask me a lot. Like, they think it's ridiculous. Like, my all my friends are, like, Trump supporters. They think it's ridiculous that I don't. I think the wall shouldn't be built, and they're like, "Well, why?" And I'm like, "Well, I don't. I don't care about the actual wall. I think, sure, if it helps, it helps. But it's the eminent domain part. The fact that they're just going to seize land from private and the money to build the wall. (laughs) (laughs) So the wall is stolen, and they're building it on stolen property. Yeah. If you want to build a wall on your own land, you are free to do so. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you want. I'm a landowner, West Texas, Southwest Texas what if landowner. Some, somebody wanted to go up and buy a strip of property all along the United States and get all of those property owners to agree to sell it. Go ahead. I would fix it right there. That'd be impossible, <laughs> though. Garrett. Oh, I mean, well, that's their argument. They're like, well, it has to be done, so the ends justifies the means. It's so dumb. It's like the wall's like not even going to... It's not even going to stop it. They'll just fly drones. Well, the vast majority of people that are here illegally, they came here legally, and then they just overstayed their visas. Yeah, and the immigration courts, like, there's, like you should have gone there two years ago. They're totally backed up. There's, there's like, there's, like, per year, there's close to a million cases that have to get, that have to go through the bureaucracy of individuals getting deported and yeah. paid more tax money <laughs> to fly them back. <laughs> So, one by one. And I, I know multiple people who have been hit by illegals. And so, like, people say, oh, they're a net benefit to our society. I'm like, you have no idea of any of the economics that go into it. They are absolutely a net drain on society. So, Positive or negative. It's like, yeah. But if the whole thing goes back to it's, it's posing another government solution to a government-induced problem. People's arguments are, well, I don't want illegals here because, number one, our justice system can't handle it. Number yeah. two, they're a drain on the welfare system. And I'm like, well, what if you took away both of those things? So what you're really <laughs> saying is that you don't like the welfare system, you don't like big government, and you also think that the government is inefficient. So because you think that the government is inefficient, 
and because that you think the government is doing things that it shouldn't be doing, you want to pr propose another inefficient government program. Yeah, they're just we'll fix it. into it's brutal. That. It's like you cover up your lie with another lie. Yeah. I don't think they've even considered the possibility of getting rid of the government. No. No. At least no, this. because we're indoctrinated from birth. Yeah. That's why, like, you mentioned homeschooling. Like, I, I used to make fun of kids. Like, BC, I used to make fun of kids that were homeschooled. Like, that's who I was. And now I, like, completely understand why people homeschool their kids. It's crazy, you know? I didn't. And my parents didn't fully. Yeah. At the time. Uh, but my dad was a private school teacher. Yeah. So he knew. He knew. He's like, this is what the private school's like. Yeah. Okay, my kids are never coming here. And he could have sent us to Liberty Christian School for free because he was a teacher. Yeah. So we get to school age and the other teachers are like, so, how old are your kids now? <laughs> and he's like, school age. And what are what are y'all doing to for school? We're homeschooling him. Okay. I mean, it's just... <laughs> it, it, we were, we're just completely indoctrinated. From it's like, I genuinely believe that Darwin's theory of evolution is a fact. Like, from my whole life. And the first time someone brought up creationism to me, I thought they were insane. <laughs> and then, here I am now, and I'm like, I think, like, macroevolution, kind-to-kind evolution is just the most absurd thing. You know, it's just... They didn't even teach that it was possible no. for there to be another explanation. They don't teach that there was a court case determining whether or not, you know... It would be allowed to be yes. taught. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I was well, actually, it was that. backwards at the time. Yeah. It was... Uh, if you wanted to, they were they were arguing that we should be able to teach evolution alongside six day creationism, yeah. and they said no, you can only teach six day creationism. It was totally backwards. <laughs> the whole purpose of that trial was to basically make a mockery of it, and it, it it changed public opinion. Even though they won the court case and said no, you can't teach evolution in schools, they Gain made notoriety. The, they made yeah, the Christian yeah. look like an idiot on the stand, and yeah. it changed public opinion. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's nuts, you know, and it's like, I can't, I can't look down on people for believing all these things, because I was literally the exact same way. I've changed my opinions too many times to be yeah. angry at people that don't agree with me, because yeah, I don't agree with my own ideas two months ago. Yeah. I, it's crazy, man. <laughs> I fluctuate all the time. Which ideas changed from two months ago? Um, tend to be more, more smaller detail-oriented things. Um... I use that just sort of as a general example. I'd have to think for a while. I'd read through back some of my DMs, but yeah, yeah. not like overarching like system deals, like small minute laws. Or well, like within the last four years, um, I was I had been struggling. I remember probably the biggest one. Four years ago, I had William Guess, who's not even a. Uh, he doesn't necessarily agree with all the Old Testament law. And he's not an anarcho-capitalist either. He's sort of a sort of a general libertarian Christian. Um, we were sitting at the Chick Fil A on 380, and he mentioned I forget what the conversation how it got started, but he just sort of mentioned that he thought that the mili military should be privatized, and that sort of that just got me thinking and then uh, a few years later I found I, I had been wondering so for like citizens arrest how can you possibly arrest somebody because what if they're innocent now you have now you have basically kidnapped this person to take them to court and then I and then through through some Bible study and unfortunately reading about unbelievers talking about this that came that happened to come to a biblical conclusion and I was like well you can't possibly have a struggling you can't possibly have private courts because there's got to be somebody that says we have absolute final authority in this area yeah. and my conclusion was it's the Bible says that if you accuse somebody wrongly of doing something then you suffer the penalty for it so that's where you have the authority to do it because when you take somebody to court somebody's getting punished yeah one of those two parties is getting it. Yeah. yeah, I've thought about that a lot recently, like the privatization of courts, privatization of military. Um, Unless you can show through some freak accident or whatever, that it was not delibera a deliberately false 
accusation. It was a, it was a totally understandable freak accident mistake, a mistaken identity, or somebody was wearing a face mask of somebody else, and you didn't know, and you accused this person. So okay, if we were to have that like wasn't a, fraudulent, malicious. If we had like a territory, right? And we decided we were going to only live through by God's law, no state, no government. How would you institute? Court, you know, courts of law, because I don't, I don't really know if the privatization thing would work. I mean, I know that all the way anarchists say like everything can work privatization, but I, I don't. Like you said, like you have to have a, an absolute authority on the matter. So I don't really know how that would, how that would work. You know? So where I'm at currently, unless you wanted to say something, um, where I'm at currently. There is a there's a slice of this that's already in effect right now. It has been for for decades. The American Arbitration Association. Never heard of. There are several different kinds of arbitration. They're only allowed by the state and the federal government to deal with uh, civil cases, yeah. not criminal. But like there's a there's an employment dispute of lost wages or oh, okay. uh, yes, okay, somebody not living up to their end of a yeah. contract. Yeah. They can take it to this private court. They pay them a fee, and they render a decision. Yeah. Yes, I've heard. I didn't. Yeah. I've heard that. So that already exists, but it's only allowed right now to be done, and it's incredibly cheap, incredibly efficient, and not very many people take advantage of it. Yes. Yeah. They probably don't know about it. <laughs> there are some people that write it into like business contracts now, to where before you take me to a criminal court, you agree to you agree to be bound by. The, the American Arbitration Association. That would be cool if more people did that. Yeah. I have it in my contracts that I do with, like, video projects. That's smart. Yeah. That's really smart. Yeah. Because the state requires that I give them some means to come after me in case I did, did something wrong. I can't just say, if I wrong you or whatever, you agree to not charge me with crimes. Like, the state of Texas, they're like, you can't do that. Sorry. They can still charge you. So, like, the way that we do it in our own territory, I think we need to govern ourselves and make our own voluntary court system. Like, we can do that now. We can agree among ourselves to, hey, I'm not going to charge you with something. The state may still try to step in, but we could try to minimize that. Do a good job of that right now. And I believe that the church should do that. Paul says um, that believers are absolutely prohibited from taking another believer before an unbelieving judge. In any case, like capital crimes, theft, whatever, you are not allowed. He says, you should rather just be defrauded than take a case to be heard by unbelievers. Just, yeah. suck, just suck it up and deal with it. And that makes sense, too. Because like, I'm in this philosophy class right now that I have to take for my humanities credit. And... I just realized, like, it, it can't work. Like, the whole subject of morality, everybody has their own definition of morality, we try to apply it to everyone. It, it doesn't work. So it's like, I, I say, how do you even, like, operate in the world? Because most people who are Christians have never even gone close to delving this deep into these kind of conversations and questions. You know, they pray the prayer, go to church, Christmas, yeah. Easter. Priest, priest or Christians. Priest or, priest or Christians. And so I'm like... How do you even begin to apply this stuff when maybe 1% of the population is even considered these things? If that. You have these types of discussions. <laughs> I, I'm learning how to do Facebook marketing, and as soon as I have a reliable enough source of income, I want to I want to create a Facebook campaign to <laughs> have these starts of, have these types of meetings start up at least in this area, if not, try to find people in other areas. Illinois, I know somebody personally to where they could host stuff like this. Yeah. And because people are on Facebook. Like, you can find people that would be interested and you... you yeah. I have a very clear definition of what the problem is. The thing that makes me really sad, though, is, like, I... It, it sounds terrible, but I, like, I don't think this is possible without some kind of, like, collapse of the current system. And it's not, like, I don't want that at all because, like, I love modern Western civilization. <laughs> Air conditioning and electricity. And well, part of the campaigning could be just, like, telling people, like, bringing to their mind parts of the problems. Yeah. Like, 
first say, here's all the problems that people don't talk about, yeah. and then... Let's try to find solutions. Yeah. It's just hard to get people interested. Like, I've only had... I have a lot of, like, friends who are believers. You know, like, that's kind of like my community at TCU. But I go to TCU, by the way. Um, and I've maybe had two people that I can I can really have, like, these level conversations with. All the rest, it's not... They're just not there. Yeah. You know? They're not there. And, so, and, and these are a minute portion of the population that are actual followers of Christ, like actually evangelizing on a normal basis. Mm-hmm. The fact that even a smaller percentage of that are willing to have these it's just... Uh, yeah, just talking to other people at all, uh, it, like, it annoys me how superficial it always is. Like, yeah. <laughs> the way to get along with people is basically to talk a lot about anything and it's nothing. It's so true. It's just like, why? It's so true. People think I'm crazy, like, not crazy, but I'm like, like that Why guy. do you want to talk about the banking system? And I'm like... It's not even that. Okay. They just want to talk about food or something. You know, and I, I, literally last night, I was, you know, I went and saw all my friends from China. They've been in China for two months, you know, spreading the gospel. And even then, it's like I only had one somewhat, somewhat deep level conversation the whole time I was there. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's tiring. Yeah. I'm like, I'm tired of, like you said, talking about food or dog. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, like, last night, I was invited to a group of... To, to spend the evening at a friend's house up in up in uh, Denison, and they're they're guys that I have sort of known superficially. I've had a couple of deep conversations with a, with one or two of them. We spent like half of the evening, like no joke, talking about like methods of how do you wipe yourself when you go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I'm just sort of sitting there, like waiting for an opportunity to change the subject. I'm just wasting for like an, for like an hour. We yeah. talk about that. It's like even sports too. Like I used like I like I was so into sports when I was a kid. Like I can name you every player in the major leagues when I was in eighth grade. Like I had I can't remember the last time I watched well TC football season last year. That was last time I sat down and watched a full televised sports ball. Whatever it be, football, basketball. I didn't even watch the NBA finals, you know, it's like it's just not interesting. It's so superficial. I think they use those things to just like all my friends, like I'm, all my friends in my fraternity, like they're just so locked into linear thinking. They have never. I try to have conversations. It's the with Matrix, them about existentialism, yeah. which I, I've, I've only seen part of. I should watch the whole movie at some point. It's trippy. It's, good it's trippy. But it's know? the Matrix. It's like yeah. you try to talk to somebody about. I mean, it would be like one fish swimming up to another fish and saying, "Hey, man, like." What is all this water stuff? Like, have you ever thought about what it would be like to get out of the water? And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, what water? <laughs> it's just, that's so true. Yeah. I've never even considered that it's possible to have what different is, views. What is dryness yeah. to a fish? Like, yeah. they've never experienced that. Like, they're all about diversity, but then yeah. they strictly mean skin color. And they don't mean thought diversity. Because if there was, then they'd just throw them out of their friend. Don't even get me started on that. Um, I get really bored. Like, my dad listens to Ben Shapiro a lot, and we have a lot of the same ideas, but I'm just like, I, this morning, like, after I woke up, I, I, there was a suggested Daily Wire video on my YouTube feed. And it was like four minutes long, so I'm like, okay, fine. I can't do the Daily Wire for an hour, but I can do it for four minutes. <laughs> That's so true. I can't handle this voice. <laughs> and I forget what they're called. There's like a there's a group of four people. Right now, it's Alexandria or Ocasio- Cortez. Yeah, the Cortez. freshman squad. Yeah. The, the, the squad. Yeah, yeah, the squad is what it's called. And he's basically talking about how stupid the squad is. And I'm like. Yeah, duh. How many hours are you going to talk about stupid people that don't agree with you and will never agree with you? Yeah, it's just I don't see any time. point to that. It's like it's the freaking it's it sounds bad, but it's the black belt, man. It's like it doesn't matter how much you try to talk to some people, they will never like ever be able to rationalize. And I will, I will respect anyone on any corner of the political spectrum if they will sit down and like be able to have a rational yeah. conversation without calling out like one of my one of my buddies is a complete neocon and he admits it but we can sit down and have rational conversations you know and it's just like and I appreciate that you know it's just yeah I'd like to see you going down the whole like 
they've entered, they've taken the diversity pill, and it's just like, it's bad. Like, you know the, uh, the communist cartoon that everybody's, they're trying to watch the baseball game, the three kids, and they get the box from the guy with two boxes, the tall guy with two boxes. And... So everybody has like one box, and then yeah. two of them can't see over the wall. But if you take from the box from the tall guy, he can still see, and then yes. the shortest person can yes. see. Yeah. They, like, were open, so I'm in student government at TCU, and it's just beating me down. Like, I, the fact that nobody else in that room, like, sees what's going on, like, they're openly advocating for communism. We're spending SGA student money to fund these events that are... Um, we, had a, we had a drag show at TC, Texas Christian University, and it said on the ad, bring your ones, and I'm like, this, I'm not even sure this is legal. Like, first of all, like, this is borderline, like, a strip club. Like, they had a drag stretch show, TCU's campus, and we funded it. They had a diversity eye-opener bus, where it's just basically completely demonizing white people. Like... And, like, we funded that with our dollars. And I stood up, and people looked at me like I was insane when I said, like, this ideology is the same ideology that led to the deaths of over 100 million people in the 20th century. And they looked at me like I was losing it. And I, people afterwards were like, dude, where did that come from? I'm like, well, good aren't you a enough, political though. science major? Do they not <laughs> teach you this stuff? Like, No, they don't. It's, it's just, oh, it's so bad. <laughs> where is TCU? It's in Fort Worth. I thought that was Tarrant County University. No, it's Texas Christian okay. University. Well, it's not like they they had a vote a few years ago. They were going to take out the Christian from the name, which I I personally think they should. It's misrepresenting Christ. Like we're not a Christian university whatsoever. We used to take one mandatory religion class, and I took religion and sports. You know, it's like <laughs> it's religion not a Christian and sports. university. They have you belong. You know pride flags and a lot of safe spaces and stuff. It's not a Christian. We don't factor Christ into any of the decisions that they make. You know? so it's just, I think they should remove it. And a lot of Christians on campus get upset when I say that. But I'm like, if you really love Christ, you I wouldn't mind taking in God we trust off of our money. Yeah, because we don't. <laughs> we don't. Like, yeah. We, it's just a... And it's not that you don't love God and that you want his name taken off of it it's like you're just mis misrepresenting him and we're just lying to ourselves you know so like I know I just went on a whole tangent about that but it's just uh, it just can't deal with it I don't know how to deal with it <laughs> it's like it's nice having like I have two of my other buddies who I can have these conversations with but it's it's just so refreshing finding real people yeah. that are somewhat broken up there's a I haven't been able to go but uh, but uh, two or three times but you should go there's a meetup group uh, called I think it's called DFW Voluntarists okay you can have these there's like 20 people that go and it's every week okay. every every Thursday night They and they alternate once in Fort Worth and then the next week is Dallas Fort Worth Dallas okay Fort Worth, Dallas. and they talk I think about I politics they talk of, it, like anything it's like people that ha that are thinking in these terms of the government is illegitimate taxation is theft yeah. therefore Here's how I conduct myself in business. Here's how I conduct myself in my daily life. The way the friends that I that I choose to interact with, um, just everything. It's like a full, fully life encompassing group. And yeah. I found found two other believers there. Most of them are unbelievers. Yeah. So that's a good place to evangelize. Because mm -hmm. you know, like you share so much commonality that. Like, then how do you believe this? You know. Well, and I can tell other people that the reason that I arrived at this ideology was because of Old Testament law, and they're like stoning and stuff, and I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, look, God warned Samuel. You know, like oh, this is what's gonna happen if you have a king. God literally warned us about what would happen. They're gonna institute ten percent taxes. Can you handle this? Buckle up, Israel. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to draft your women and your uh, men into the army. They're going to turn your women into servants. You know, mm -hmm. it's like... Mm -hmm. They're going to take the best of your horses and the best of your chariots. God warned mm -hmm. against a 10%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's just go back to that. It cracks me up. Yeah. <laughs> Every time. Like, if but, people voluntarily give away 30% of their income, if not more, once you factor in everything else. Yeah. It's atrocious. Yeah, yeah like, half, half of what you pay in... Gas. Half of that is taxes. To pay for the roads that aren't even well kept. The dominoes has to go fill in the potholes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
Yes, we did. <laughs> That's so funny. Right. So let me let me get your thoughts on this. I genuinely feel like I'm. So I have got like a year and a half left. I'm a nursing major. I've got like a year and a half left before I take my NCLEX RN and start working full time. So I've only worked one like job that I actually pay taxes. Um, all my other jobs are off the books, like lawn stuff, like lawn beads, stuff like that. Never paid taxes. Um, I feel genuinely conflicted about paying taxes. Like, not that, because I, I don't have a problem with separating from 30% of my income if it were going to, you know, if I was giving it to groups that were evangelizing all over the world or, you know, Christian organizations that were giving out, you know, meals to the poor and, and serving the poor. I would have no issue giving away half my money if it was going to that stuff. I genuinely have a problem with giving my money to the government because I know that, you know, $500 million a year is being given to Planned Parenthood. Um, you know, built you know, $800 billion a year is funding the military that we're using to, you know, destabilize other countries for political gain. Like, mm -hmm. what do I do? Like, I'd like to hear y'all's thoughts on this. Like, I genuinely don't know what to do. Like, I can't live off Bitcoin and gold. Like, <laughs> they will find me, and I can't have a normal life if I do that. I can't ask someone to marry me and take part in that, because that would be selfish. You know, asking them to live a John McAfee lifestyle. <laughs> you know? Like, what, what do y'all think about that? We talked about this. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really have anything... Yeah, I don't know enough about that to be able to say something, so I'll let Adam answer. Okay. <laughs> Fair. I respect that. Um, there is a... Do you remember when... Uh, there are a couple of instances where Jesus was asked about what his opinions were on taxes. Yes, Romans. Well, not Romans 13. But, yeah. Romans 13 is about the submit authority, the uh, worldly authorities. But yeah, because they are under Caesar. So that's good. Yeah, <laughs> so it's an illegitimate authority if they're carrying out evil. Yeah, that's that's easy for me. The render under Caesar. I've, I I I have an article that I read about, and I've got it bookmarked, but I always. I always forget, like, because people ask me this all the time when I say I'm a follower, but that I'm also an anarchist. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on the word anarchist later. Um, they say, well, dude, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. That means it's your money in the government. And I'm always like, no, it's not. But it kind of is, you know. It's like, in my mind, correct me if I'm wrong, I want to hear what you say about this. Jesus was completely delegitimizing. Also, like the coin that was using was an extremely rare coin. Like it wasn't a coin that was commonly circulated throughout that part of uh, the world, essentially. Okay. Um, I forget the exact name of it, but it was a very rare coin that was like it had a lot, held a lot of value, like very high value coin. That would like in our world would have been like thousands of dollars, um, and so that's why you know the Pharisees were carrying it because they had a lot of money. Um, so he hands them this coin, and basically Jesus completely delegitimizes the value of it. So this this means nothing to me. Like this coin that has the face of a false god Caesar on it. Um, I'm not even going to take part in this. I'm not going to utilize this, and neither should you. If you, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, like give this back to him. If he wants to be a god, he can be a god. But this value, this currency, has no value. So that's essentially my interpretation of render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So well, you have to define what is Caesar's legitimately. That's fair. That's that's really good. Point. So the whole the whole crux of the argument is that this was something that the Pharisees used to trap Jesus. They, they thought that they had him because if he if they they're like okay, so if Jesus says pay taxes, all the people are going to leave him because they're not that's not what they want to hear. If he says don't pay taxes, then the Romans are going to come in and say hey you're building up an insurrection against us, telling people not to pay tribute to to Caesar. We got you, Jesus. Whatever you say. You're either going to make the Jews angry or you're going to make the Romans angry. And so Jesus doesn't answer the question. <laughs> and like you said, the, for, the question that I would ask is, what is Caesar's? Um, so this is Matthew 22, 15. 
Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words, and they sent their disciples to him along with Herodians, with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought to him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to him, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. So, number one, ultimately speaking, who is that? Who does that coin belong to? Caesar, because he manufactures it. No. It doesn't. It belongs to God. The coin belongs to God? God made the universe. Everything that's in it belongs to him. The Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Not just a thousand, but all, all of them, poetically speaking. Everything that Caesar had has been... He is a steward of it, and God has been... God has authorized him as a steward at the present time. That ties into Romans 13, and it says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Not just authorities themselves, not just us, and not authorities, but authorities themselves also have to be subject to the governing authorities. Yeah, because they are people at the end of the day. So, yeah. So, and it says, my, there's so no authority why would, except why would for he God. say? Why would he not say? So if Caesar didn't, so if Caesar, if the coin, if he was not referencing that that coin belonged to Caesar. Why would he not just say, render unto God what is God's? I don't want to say he weaseled his way out because he's it's Jesus. But he, he found the third option, also didn't answer the question. So then it, it always goes back to the question. What is Caesar's and what is God's? Yeah. You, I, you just said that everything belongs to God. Everything Caesar. ultimately belongs to yeah. God. There are certain things that Caesar is a legitimate steward over. He's a legitimate steward over his body. He may be misusing it. He may be a bad steward. So the question really is, how do you deal with an authority that starts to become unlawful? When you say unlawful, it starts to, to God's do things, law? Yeah, God's law. Not like <laughs> not their human own. law. Yeah, I was about to be like, well, anybody can be lawful if they operate within the laws they write. Yeah, but that's not a thing, just like, like you just mentioned. That doesn't exist. Moral morality being subjective and everybody yeah. having their own ideas about right and wrong and acting on it yeah. that can't that can't exist. It's false. Yeah. Um, so it's only God's law is the only thing that really applies. So I mean, what do I think? I mean, just, I think disposing of said unlawful authority, whether that be through peaceful means, hopefully, um, or by violent means. The there's two, yeah, there's two. Or do you to operate it. and do you turn the other cheek and operate within the society? You know, that's a discussion in and of itself. Yeah. yeah, there's two ways to remove, there's two ways to remove lawless. Well, actually, there's really only one way to remove law, lawlessness. The only variable is who suffers the consequences of it. The only way that lawlessness can be dealt with is penalty. So the, then the question becomes, who carries okay, out the penalty? Who, who, who takes it? Who takes the penalty? That is something that we have an option over, except for one type of crime listed in the Old Testament, in my current understanding, which would be somebody falling away from the faith while still calling themselves a member of that faith. So there's one where it says, there's a law that says, um, this is going into a quick rep, quick detour. No, it's an interesting topic. Right? If somebody says, if somebody comes up to you secretly and says, let's go worship another god, it says you're supposed to kill that person. But it specifically says secretly. If somebody openly comes into you and says, hey, I don't worship Christ anymore. I believe in other gods. Hey, you should come join me. That's different. It's somebody that says that to everybody else, they say, yeah, I'm a Christian. And then they come to you and say, hey, we're Christians. We should go worship this other god. That is a capital crime. That's the so only the second? thing. Well, that's the only yeah. thing that I'm aware of to where somebody else can't substitute themselves and say, "Hey, I would like to die in this person's place for committing that crime," yeah. which was open for for murder, adultery, and all that stuff. Somebody, I don't think it ever happened, 
yeah. but I know redemption was something that Europe people were allowed to do. At least. It was about fulfilling the somebody is dying for the crime. Somebody somebody is dying. Yeah. If you want to step in and offer your own means in order to pay for that, you're allowed to do so. Except when somebody comes to you secretly and tries to have you wor- come and worship a different god. What if it's unknowingly? Like, obviously back then, you know, there were a, a, a large prevalence of false gods that were consistently tempting the Israelites. Now we have, like, more... We have so many... So obviously you have religion for false gods, like Islam and Hinduism. Um, but what about the idols that we turn into gods? Like, I have friends that have declared in the name of Jesus. We did the whole thing, posted on Instagram, how their life was changed. Um, and then two or three months later completely back into drinking and, and hooking up with girls and you know having relationships outside of marriage I have no idea how to handle that I've tried to have conversations with them and they just shut it down they don't even want to talk do they still think that they're Christians or have they just totally still a bible verse in the bio so yeah I think so I think the honest answer is I do think so I think it's Maybe they're just not studying at all. Like maybe they know the basics to trust God for they're, Well, we they, so it, it's it was, it's one of my buddies that so I went to this summer project called Kaleo last year. Um, it's like nine weeks, and you're with um, like believers and you're in D, small D groups and like there's we go through obviously the basics, but we go into like depth too. And I've told like things to these guys in my D group that I've never told to anyone else in the whole world. You know, so you go like pretty deep, and so. I feel like there's no excuse. Like, they know. They know the consequences. They know the reality. They know everything. Yet claim to be, you know, present their testimony in front of 400, presented his testimony in front of 400 people. And that same weekend, went out with his buddies, got blacked, like, twice. And then ended up dating this girl who's not a follower within a month after giving his testimony in front of 400 people. You know, I'm like... That's like bearing false witness in my mind. Like, so I don't, I don't know how to hit. Like, what do you do about that? <laughs> yeah. So I was looking up this verse. Sorry, what was the, um, what was the context of that again? Um, long story short, a friend committed his life to Christ. Um, you know, really felt genuinely. We thought he was genuinely changed. Um, presents his testimony in front of 400 people at student late night, and everyone loved it. It was great. Um, and then that same weekend, his parents came into town, started drinking again within three months, completely back in his old ways, but still claiming Christ. I, I have no idea what to say, how to handle the situation, you know. I see that. I see that all the time, too, and I, I have friends that do it. Um, one of them was a girl. She... She fornicated with another guy that actually claims to believe that all the Old Testament stuff does apply and all this stuff today. And I, I told her, I walked her through these laws. I said, okay, number one, your dad's a believer, and so you're technically the daughter of a priest. So the penalty for that is burning you. I don't think we can expect that right now. So what's the next best thing? There's another passage that says that a priest is not allowed... The, let's see. The high priest is has to marry somebody that can't have been divorced or widowed or anything. Like, it has to be a girl who has never been married before and she's pure that's the picture of the high priest because that's Christ but then for stepping down from the high priest the regular priests they're allowed to marry widows but they can't marry somebody that's divorced with a husband still living well normally people couldn't do that anyway right because that'd be adultery there was um, yeah possibly I need to look at that again there was also the, the temporary allowance that Moses gave them because of the hardness of their hearts where people were allowed to give their wives a certificate of divorce. Yeah, but then Jesus. But Jesus said that anybody who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Right. Um, 
So I said, so if it's not the death penalty, it's you should remain single for the rest of your life because this isn't you married somebody and now you're divorced. This is you had extramarital a relationship with somebody. So now you're not married, so you can't get divorced, and you're also not pure. You're not pure anymore. A believing man who is a priest. Priests are not allowed to marry a woman that's been defiled. And so I said, if you get married, you can't marry a believer. And also, since you are a believer, you're not allowed to marry an unbeliever either. Yeah. So you need to remain single for the rest of your life. And Probably didn't take that too well. Now, now she's messing around with another guy. And she's gonna, she's, I think she's going to marry him in the next several months. So you said normal priests, besides Jesus, the high priest, can normal priests cannot... They can't marry somebody that... Uh, the only type of person that they could marry that's either been married or had sex before would be a widow. Somebody that was married and then the husband died. Regular priests were allowed to marry those people. So what about born-again believers who, you know, had a life before Christ and committed themselves to Christ and since committing themselves to Christ, they pure. I would say that they should not get married either. Oh, man. That's where I'm at now. Subject to change and further study. Yeah. No, that, I, I that's understand. where I'm at now because it's Paul said that um, that sexual immorality even being named among you is already defeat. But that's named among the church. Yeah. Of already converted mm-hmm. believers. Right. So before it was, yeah, okay, that was a repentant, repentant thing. But also, and this is something that we talked about with Hunter, um, we, and we applied it to murder, but now apply that to adultery. What would, so let's, let's, let's apply this to murder real quick, and then I'll bring it back around to taxes. We're okay. say, taking sort of a long detour. So, um, let's say that uh, an unbeliever murdered somebody, did 10, 20 years in prison for it, whatever, gets back out, becomes a believer, and then they start getting familiar with all this stuff. And they say that, I didn't pay the penalty that was laid out in here. I'm repentant now because I'm a believer. What would repentance look like for a murderer? I mean, voluntarily having yourself executed. Stone. That's what I would say. That'd be the simplest, easiest, most straightforward answer. The ideologically consistent answer. Would be that. So, what about for somebody that's committed adultery before they were a believer? Follow the same. Um, so this is this is where. So this is. I, I don't mean to interrupt. This is my caveat. So you know, Jesus said, "Any man who looks upon a woman with lust," and this applies to women as well. Have committed adultery in their heart. Uh, anyone who's looked upon his fellow man and hated him in his heart has committed murder in his heart. So, therefore, in Jesus' eyes, if we've all committed adultery, no one should be getting married. There's right? a difference between adultery in the heart and physical adultery in terms of penalties that are applied. Okay. Obviously, a sin, a sin committed in the heart is worthy of eternal death yes. in God's eyes. Yeah. We're talking about Okay. Civil criminal justice, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. which is really, it's it's it never ultimately saves anybody to execute a murderer. That doesn't save anybody. Yeah, it's a picture okay. of God's justice, ultimate justice, so that we have a picture in the here and now, in the physical life, so that you can understand the reality of the consequences in somebody's spiritual life. So another caveat to that is like obviously through, like there's a reason it's called born again, like I guess through baptism, purification. In the eyes of God, um, at least I believe that uh, not fresh, like you've been given a fresh slate in my sense. Like you've submitted your life to Christ. And now it's Christ living, Christ living in you. Living yeah. in you. So Christ washes away the penalty for our sin um, through the sacrifice on the cross. Now that doesn't mean that we can go on living in sin. It mm-hmm. calls us to turn from our sin, repent from our sin, and trust in Him. Washed away the eternal penalty or the yep. earthly penalty or both? Eternal penalty. So then you still have the earthly penalty, right? 
I, I guess that's what I'm asking you all. Like, is that... I mean, it doesn't really specify. I'm assuming it's referring to the eternal world. And since we are not bound by the Old Testament law anymore as believers, Christ is Christ died under the law in my place. And so now, if you, if you have time later on, read through Romans 7. Okay. That's this whole discussion. Okay. It's what is the difference between law and sin, and now we are believers. And Paul said, well, we know that the law is good if one uses it according to the law. So if the law is good, but then the law killed me, and I realized that I was dead underneath it, is that, did that which is good bring death to me? And Paul says, no. It's sin that killed yeah, you. Yeah, it's not the law that killed you. Yeah, I, yeah. I've seen that verse, though, read two different ways. Um, Joel McDormand read it as, we know that the law is good, and then elaboration in accordance with the gospel. So basically, we know the law is good. Is that in Second Timothy 1? First Timothy 1. First Timothy 1. So Joel McDermott reads it. Now I know that the law is good in accordance with the gospel. Like, it is good because it's in accordance with the gospel. And then I've seen other people read it. We know the law is good if it's in accordance with the gospel. I think they're compatible. But, like, what, I'm confused about the word if. Like, some people think that maybe the law isn't yeah, like consistent with the gospel. Whatever... Whatever parts of the law is consistent with the gospel. Meaning that some parts aren't? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we have to divide the parts yeah. of the law in the Old Testament that yeah. were not consistent with the gospel? Well, that's what a lot of people do by dividing up the moral, civil, and ceremonial. It's just, that's tough because I know that's extra biblical. I, I don't see any distinction between moral, civil, ceremonial. In Hebrews, it talks about shadows. There are, sha- there are things that are shadows in the Old Testament and there are things that weren't shadows in the Old Testament. They didn't divide those laws based on, in the Old Testament, like, any of those laws carried their own punishment. So it's, it's just, and they couldn't say, like, oh, this doesn't apply as much because it's part of this subgroup of laws. Like, you're accountable for all of them. Well, I guess they're saying that um, it's not in accordance with the gospel if you still make them die for adultery or something because God's supposed to forgive you. I mean... Will forgive you from your eternal punishment. Like that, right, I've right. always gone to that. Like once you commit your life to Christ, like God doesn't guarantee that your life is going to be like great. Like if anything, like you should have some suffering in your life. Yeah. Like honestly, and so. I mean, if your life is great, you're probably doing it wrong. Well, and it yeah. was Christ's life was suffering for all the things that he didn't do. Yeah. On top of so, like, okay, Christ was perfect, and he didn't have anything that he was needed to pay for mistakes that he made. He paid for other people's mistakes. So now, God paid for my mistakes. So now I'm clean. So now I don't have any sins of my own that I need to pay for in an eternal sense. So what do I have my physical life be for now? My physical life, like in business, but then also in moral issues. There are things that I'm not guilty of that I look around and I see that other people are. Are there things that I can do? Like... What is my spirit of how how do I respond to people that wrong me? How do I respond to people that I see wronging each other? And they're not believers. I want to get them to follow Jesus and then right after they follow Jesus I'm like, by the way, if you're con- being consistent with yourself, then you you, ha- you can't get married and if you know, if someone's let's say convicted on death row, they're gonna get killed anyways. Like Jesus is not going to save you from this, you know. Like, or, but what if you do that while even they're yet unbelievers? Because while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God, that's when Christ died for us. But then there's that verse, um, it's in First Corinthians six. It says, "Well, it lists capital crimes, and it says, and such were some of you." And he's talking to the church. Also, to actually put somebody to death, you have to have the witness requirements and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Was it two or three witnesses? Two or three. Yeah. So let's say that somebody previously committed adultery yeah. and was was um, 
Oh, well, I guess in, in modern day, nothing happened to him. He got divorced, whatever. But maybe his wife is, his first wife is still alive, and the person that he committed adultery with are still alive. But they don't really, they don't really care. They sort of have moved on. Um, now he's a believer, and he says, "I have committed adultery and a capital crime." Well, you can't, you can't execute somebody unless you have multiple witnesses. Where are the witnesses? It would probably be him and the woman that he committed adultery with. That's that's two witnesses. But she wouldn't want to testify because she doesn't want to get involved. She probably doesn't doesn't care. She either doesn't care or doesn't want to get involved. Or maybe she does. So it's just like you have to you do have to have the multiple witnesses to carry it out. And if you don't, then then it's like like I said, all of the the criminal penalties in this life are all a picture to show in the next life. And if you we have a spirit of obeying that we'll be blessed and we'll be you know, God will will multiply us. It's just I, I have two friends that um, are probably gonna get married. I just don't know how long it's gonna be until he pops a question, you know. Um, but I know like, you know, it's in his t- part of his testimony when he shares with us. You know, he had a girlfriend before he submitted his life to Christ and obviously uh, they were having extramarital relations. So when I look at something like that, and like they're obviously in love, they're both dedicated servants of Christ. Like, how I, I just can't. I don't know. Maybe that's also a really interesting question. Speak question because in the Old Testament, when it's talking about priests, it means males. Yeah. There are no female priests. Yeah. Oh well, I take that back. There, there is actually a mention of a female priest. I can't remember where it is, but it's in there somewhere. I'll have to find it. Um, but specifically, when he's when this law is given in the Pentateuch, it's the sons of Levi that are the priests. At that point, I believe there weren't any female priests, and it definitely would not be referring to them because it well, refers to them as the sons of Aaron. Yeah, it was also specifically the sons of Aaron. But now everybody is made priests. Right. So that's another thing that makes it kind of complicated because there are we have female priests now. You're a priest. Mm-hmm. We're priests. So, but in the in the law where it says that a priest can't marry. He has a, a priest has to take uh, a wife in her virginity. I don't think the Bible ever refers to males as virgins, so that kind of complicates things. And I don't know how that would work, honestly speaking. Like in the New Testament, um, or in the in the Old Testament. You're right. I I I cannot recall any verse that comes to mind of even referencing male virginity in the Old Testament. I, I, I don't think I've read it. Yeah, that's not a thing. And also, yeah. the penalty for uh, the daughter of a priest who fornicates, she shall be burned. It specifically says the daughter of a priest, not the sons of a priest. So it's like, oh, different penalty for a man and woman. Yeah. There, are only two, there are only two crimes in the Old Testament that specify burning as the, as the specific mode of death penalty. One is for the daughter of a priest who fornicates, and the other is for a man who marries a woman and her mother. But if it's a daughter of a priest, but... Not a son. Yeah. Well, no, the female's already a priest, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that people can just qu- transition to get out of these punishments. <laughs> <laughs> well, if she's already a priest, and it's not her daughter who fornicated, or uh, committed adultery, then... Well, and that also makes the question, okay, so in like it, today, if there's a, gir- a, a believing girl and her dad is not a believer, I mean, he's not a priest, and she fornicates, then she doesn't get burned? Sorry, I don't, one, one step back. Um, just, it's an interesting concept. So, how do you connect the, uh, you know, the Levitical priests, and now we are all, like, priests, like, I know we are all... So that's something that's specifically we're told is a shadow that has been, we have been revealed given the full light of that. So we definitely can't go back to the old way of doing that. Animal sacrifices in the temple. We still do sacrifices in the temple, but it, the form has changed. We have the reality of that now. So since Christ was our sacrifice, that that's what makes us all priests in the eyes of God? Okay. Well, and... Um, since it's open to anyone, it's not restricted to the sons of Aaron or whatever. Well, yeah, it says okay. that, I think this is in Hebrews 7 or 8, somewhere in that area. Um, it says that Christ 
well, somebody makes the argument, or the author of Hebrews makes the argument, Christ was not descended from Levi, so how can he be a priest? He's from the tribe of Judah, and the law doesn't say anything about there being priests coming from the tribe of Judah. And he said, goes back to Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest and a king. And Jesus is part of the... And Jesus is after his order, not after Levi's order. And Melchizedek is a higher priest than the sons of Aaron were. Well, there's lots of verses that say we're priests now. Okay. Revelation specifically says that we're kingly priests. Okay. Okay. Which I don't think that they had in the Old Testament. Melchizedek was a king and a priest. But then in the kingdom of Israel, you had the priests, and they were not kings. And you had David, and he was not a priest. So you had him separated out for some reason. So it's like you had a sort of a lesser version so that God could do all these foreshadowings. And then he finally brings them together back in Christ, and then we're also after after that order. I just wanted a basis just because, like, my... This is going to be a very new concept to most of the Basis, like you want... concept to me. You want specific basis. verses that yeah. say we're priests? I'll yes. give them to you. They're right here. The, uh, the, yeah, the application for that. All of these are here. Yeah. And that one. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that, that... I've been looking for that verse. That one was... I was just... Uh, I just yeah. came across that last night. I was wondering if it applied to us now about how about how the um, now that we're priests and then the priests violated the Sabbath I was just wondering Does if Jesus give us was permission thinking to that, violate the okay, Sabbath okay, okay, besides okay. Hebrews because that one I had been wondering because okay this brings up another discussion um, in, in Hebrew the word for work and worship are the same word there is no difference so the way that we do that what we call worship like Sunday morning worship yeah. they would call not work, not worship at all. Because Jesus did that on the Sabbath and nobody, he read scripture and preached. Yeah. And nobody had a problem with that. So the thing that we call worship today, they would not have thought of as worship at all. And as a matter of fact, they would have said that that's the only thing that's not worship. Really? Because I mean, like David would um, write psalms to the Lord. Like those could be representative of songs he'd dance. I mean, that was considered worship, right? Um, like him dancing before the Lord. I don't see. Well, in Hebrew, there's no distinction between work and worship. They're all. It's all, all the same thing. Like the work that I do throughout the week to earn money. If I'm doing that for God, that's worship. Mm-hmm. So. There was a there's a specific passage where Jesus reads from Isaiah and says like this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. He's because it was it was traditional for them to gather in the synagogue on the Sabbath. I think, or did they gather on did they gather for synagogue on Friday? I'm pretty sure it says it was it was the Sabbath when he when he read that prophecy. That wasn't considered work for him to read scripture on the Sabbath. Well, work can be worship, but also what other people think of as worship can also be worship. Well, the thing is that what was considered, another thing that was considered work and worship was offering sacrifices in the temple. Considered work? You say work or work? Okay. Work, work, work worship. Avodah is the Hebrew word. Yeah. Um, here, I was like, but I think there were some specific days, like the Day of Atonement, where they were specifically told to offer sacrifice, to worship. <laughs> And that would fall on the Sabbath. This is what I was thinking of. This is what I sort of couldn't get around. So this sort of brings that argument home for me. Haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath? Well, how do they violate the Sabbath? They worship God on the Sabbath. I thought it just was, well, without thinking about that specific part, I thought it was just talking about them doing their jobs. Their job is to the servant the temple. So just that's worship. Yeah, but doing their job on the Sabbath. The, if somebody was not a priest and they tried to offer a sacrifice on the Sabbath, they would be put to death. Wait, say that again. If somebody was not a priest and he worshipped or did work, gather firewood, whatever, tried to offer a sacrifice on the Sabbath, you would be executed. Mm-hmm. 
because he's not a priest offering a sacrifice in the temple. In other words, I mean, Jesus is saying here that the priests, they do violate the Sabbath, but they're innocent because they're told to. Right. They work on the day that they're not supposed to. So what was the thing you were wondering? The, well, the thing that I was wondering is that how can, because I didn't know that, I didn't know that that was a thing, that Jesus considered that the priests are, vi- they are violating the Sabbath. Okay. You just didn't know that it was considered violation. I thought, like, so I was thinking maybe my concept of it was just faulty. Maybe that, maybe offering sacrifices in the temple wasn't considered worship. But in Matthew twelve five, Jesus is saying that it is, definitely is. Okay. Well, what I was thinking about that verse was, um, the priests violate the Sabbath, but now we're priests, so we can violate the Sabbath too. We can, we can work, because yeah. our, yeah. our works are acceptable. Mm-hmm. Because we're offering them in the temple and we're priests. Mm-hmm. And then Hebrews 4, too, about Jesus being a priest. Because mm. Jesus violated the Sabbath. He worked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about For all the too. times when we could. So basically, anything that we're doing as an offering to God in our work is permissible on the Sabbath. That's the concept. Well, Christ is also our Sabbath rest. Okay. And then Paul also says that don't let anybody judge you in regard to uh, a feast or a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. Because those were all a shadow of Christ and now Christ is the reality of those things. Okay. So... Uh, somebody who wants to worship that, fine. Want, wants to obey all those things, fine. Somebody who doesn't, fine. But Christ is the reality of those things. So now in the New Testament, if you're if you're not resting in the true Sabbath, you do die eternally. Because it means you're not a believer. Because you're not resting in Christ's work. You're not resting on the real Sabbath. Yeah. So the Sabbath still is here and still applies, but the form of it is higher, it's been elevated, and we have the reality of it. And that's the same thing for the feasts and the festivals. Yeah. Those were all, in the Sabbath, the new moon, those were all pointing to Christ. So it's not to say that those things are abolished, it's they're fulfilled. So we still keep them, but it looks different in how we do it today. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, this is like a topic that I've just been like thinking about for a while now. Cause... Sabbath rest? No. Old, Old Testament. In our so culture. the way that I read the, New, the Old Testament now is oh, um, I don't understand that or I haven't heard anybody talk about it and we definitely don't do that today so therefore it's sort of a general consensus and I think that there are probably scholars way back that figured all this stuff out and our, have, our culture has been shaped because according to it because we know now that this doesn't apply. Okay. And so if it doesn't make sense to me, yeah. that's just going to be my default position. I take the opposite now. I think this applies to me. Perhaps the form has changed and it looks different in its application, but it still applies. And so now it's not a question of does it apply or not, it's what does that look like. Yeah. Yeah. And there are a lot of questions that I have and I don't know the answer to. What does it mean today to, sac- to season all my sacrifices with salt? What are our tassels on your shirt? Or what about rounding the edges of your hair <laughs> and not wearing the uh, edges, edges of your, of your beard? beard? Start yeah. looking like a Jew or a boy. <laughs> yeah, what about those? Well, by the way, yeah. that's what that looks like. Um, the tassels thing, I think, would actually probably would, would still apply. It's also interesting to note that it's the reason that we do that is not because if you don't do it, you get penalized. It's because if you don't do it, you'll forget to obey God and you'll go whoring after other gods. It's like a reminder. Like a it's a reminder. reminder. Yeah. Which I think we could do with a bit more reminders. So could this be considered a tassel since I never take it off? Well, it specifically Physical says reminder. that it has to have a thread of blue in it. That's so that's have- thread and it says the corners of your garments, not your wrist. <laughs> so so I bought some zitzit uh, that's what they call them and they look so tacky oh my gosh so like there's no there's not a specific pattern that we're given of they must be wrapped around six times and then 13 times to signify the 613 commandments which is like if you go on Amazon and buy some that's that's what they're modeled after and they look super tacky and it just says put tassels on the edges of your on the fringes of your garment 
and have a quart of blue ahead. Any way you want to do that, that's fine. The Jews have turned that into, it's you add all these traditions and extra requirements onto it to where it's, it's, it's this own thing to where now you can't clip it on it has to. You have to have a buttonhole sewn into it, and then you thread it through the buttonhole. And it's got to be wrapped around this many times, and it's got to be at least this long. And you have to wear four of them. And it can't just go on any garment. It's got to go on a special shawl. And yeah, so it's like that's not in the law. It's all stuff that they've added to it, which they're particularly prone to doing. <laughs> so guys aren't allowed to trim their beards at all. Um. Says Mar the editor. There's there's quite a few articles that have been written on this. And it goes into like specific work meanings of words. And where I'm at currently is that you can't uh, like you can you can shorten things because and we're also told that we're we can't let our hair grow untrimmed. Can't. Can't. Okay. Hair, beard. I'm not sure. And also, what it means by mar the edges of your beard. Does that mean you can't cut off the ends, or does that mean that you can't do the outlines? Is that, is that the edge, or is this the edge? No fades. And yeah. Ancient. So I would just think both, since it's not specific. <laughs> so, well, and in ancient Israel, like everybody, all men had full beards. No matter how much you could grow or couldn't grow. Yeah, but if you never, never ever trim your beard, then it could start looking unruly, right? <laughs> Yeah. Some people have smoother beards. I have a really particularly scraggly one. Some people grow like really straight hair, and it looks like a woman's nice head of hair. It's so like it's perfectly straight. Like Asians, that's how they grow beards. <laughs> yeah. It just it's just different. But I think I think really what they're getting into is that. Well, and, and another thing is that we're specifically told that for a man to be clean shaven. I don't know if God is just affirming something that was culturally the case, or if he's saying that it should be a shame for a man to be totally clean-shaven. Because at least in Hebrew culture, at least, that was a, it was incredibly embarrassing not to have a beard. Like, to the point, uh, what, what was it? Somebody sent some serv- some of David's servants back to him, but before they did it, they shaved, they yeah. shaved off half of all their beards. And David said, don't come back to me until your beards are fully grown back. And they spent like a year or months in the city basically hiding from David so that he wouldn't have to see them with clean shaven faces. <laughs> yeah. You're saying Jesus readdressed that? In, uh, I'm not sure if he did or not. Um, in the in the Old Testament, at least, God, God specifically... Well, there are, there are curses that he prescribes to Israel. And he said, it will be like your beard is shorn off. And locusts will come and eat. Like it's, you won't have any crops. And to cap it all off, you're gonna, your beard is gonna get shaven off. Jesus it's sort of that? like, no, in the Old Testament, oh. when it was when it was outlining uh, penalties and judgments that were gonna take place on Israel. So, and that's I mean, it's something that God specifically says that having your beard shaved off is a disgrace. And was that just because it's something that the Hebrews valued very highly, or was it because there is something in the law that says, don't shave off your beards? There, the only time that a man was allowed, what was commanded to shave off his beard was basically when he had a skin infection. You shave off, you shave off your beard, you show it to the priest, if there's yellow hair growing in it, whatever, you're clean, unclean, then you go sit in isolation for seven days, and then if it... If it doesn't spread, then you're pronounced clean by the priest, and then you're, you let your beard grow back. Well, it probably was just because... Well, that specific one was probably because of, that's how the Hebrews thought of it. But since it also says, don't mind the end of it, it probably is both at the same time. I think it might be a guard against androgyny. Because <laughs> there are some guys that look like girls. Yeah. <laughs> I think God wants a clean, a clear distinction of this is girl, this yeah. is a guy. You don't mix them. You don't have women going around wearing men's clothes. You don't have men going around wearing women's clothes. You don't men. You don't shave to look like a woman. Women. You don't shave your hair. It's a disgrace for you to shave your hair, your head. You can distinguish like, a guy and a girl just between short hair and long hair, though. I mean, but there are guys that have long. Maybe hair. I don't know. <laughs> there are I'm some saying, very debatable people. I've seen. I'm saying oh theoretically. Head. Not practically, because... Yeah. I'm just like, in, even in America, modern day, as, as secular as we are, and I don't like to use that word, secular, um, 
one of them is anti. Well, we it's not that we don't have a God, it's that we have just a different God. I agree. As a society. Yeah. Our laws come from corporate man, our, our humanis- yeah. humanistic type laws. Yeah. Uh, man is God. Yeah. But it's like, even in modern day American culture, it's like, I, I appreciate being shown the currency by a guy to like, let me know that you're a guy just at yeah. a glance. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> That's well, they could nice. do that. They could do that without worrying about the beard. They could just have short hair, theoretically. Mm-hmm. Wait, but I see. I'm seeing more girls that have short hair too. Circle this back to taxation. Okay, we, I forgot okay. we were going to do that. Yeah, and I was like, wait. Uh, there's another. This back to taxation. So the render to Caesar is one. There's also yeah. another one, um, where there are some guy. P- Peter and Jesus are walking around, and some guys come up to them and say, "Hey." Mikey. Temple tax, yeah. temple tax, they're collecting the temple tax. Oh, yeah. Matthew 17, 24 to 27. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, From others... Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the fish that first, first, the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. So Jesus said, It's lawful to pay the tax. The reason being not to give a needless offense. And Jesus is also saying that you don't owe it either. Well, when, could you differentiate a temple tax between, you know, because that was specifically utilizing? I, I don't know. Obviously, I don't know a ton about temple taxes in ancient Israel. So there but, was there was a head tax that was commanded in the Old Testament, but I don't know if it was specifically for the temple. Like, was that money being used for? Pay, I don't want to say paying temple employees, but upkeep of the temple and. There was something when when the. When the original temple was built under Solomon, it was yeah. the big temple to the full specifications. That one was t- t- torn down and destroyed. They rebuilt a temple, but it was like a third the size of the original. And that was the one that was there in Jesus' day. The original temple, I think Solomon actually taxed the people when he shouldn't have. And he had all of the... They basically built... They built the Solomon built the temple sort of the same way that the Jews built the pyramids for Egypt. They were enslaved under Pharaoh and they were building the pyramids Solomon sort of turned around and did that exact same thing contrary to the law and had and had conquered Gentiles build the temple using tax money from the Israelites yeah so this is a really interesting picture and foreshadowing there but you're saying the tax money was the part that was wrong not the I think the tax money and the labor the slave labor that Solomon used to build the temple. But I thought you were allowed to make slaves out of um, conquering foreigners if you had a war. Um, I'd have to go back and read it. I, I, my Deuteronomy recollection 20, is that... Is Deuteronomy 23 that talks about that? Uh, like when you're allowed to enslave yeah, other people? Through war. Uh, that's Deuteronomy 20, 20. 1 through 14. Um, I, I, I want to go back to... I think it's in it's either Kings or Chronicles one of them um, well it's an interesting foreshadowing there and Solomon shouldn't have shouldn't have done that I remember from reading it but also it's a foreshadowing of sort of the new covenant being built the temple right now is being built by Gentiles because believers are God's body and Gentiles are the primary source of how the kingdom is growing at yeah. this point It says, verse 11 in Deuteronomy 20, If it responds to you peaceably and opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. And that's when you draw to, near to a city to fight it. That's your terms of peace. Right. Well, that temple tax obviously wouldn't even apply to connecting Gentiles because they couldn't go into the temple. But it's interesting that when um, Jesus says, well, who pays that temple tax? And and Peter said, everybody except the family members of the ones who are collecting it. And Jesus said, 
then his family members are free, implying that the people who are required to pay the tax are not free. They're slaves. Right. And then, but then Jesus says, nevertheless, however, not to give offense, pay it. Meaning that, Peter, you are free. I am free. So all of the sons of Israel should have been? All of the sons of the people that are collecting the tax. Um, that's, uh, I, I need to go and do some, some, some more study about whether that temple tax was legitimate or not. But I'm thinking that it's that um, it was at least not legitimate for them to collect it from Jesus and Peter. But And Jesus' attitude is... For the sake of not causing... An, a, uh, undue or, offense. Yeah, undue yeah. offense. So it's, that's, that was something that was helpful for me. When, when the federal government says, hey, Adam, you owe me taxes. I know I don't. I don't owe what they say that I owe. But I'm going to pay it not to give offense. Yeah. And I, I'm allowed to do that. Well, I just struggle with, like, when I know what that money is being used for, it's like... So, I, and I live yeah. and I live my life in trying to... Uh, and this is something that's going to happen in my lifetime. The United States government will crash at some point. Yeah. Um, it sounds ridiculous to say that, just like it would have sounded ridiculous to say that Rome will fall. Yeah. Oh, you know, in 400... In, in the year 200 BC. It's a world superpower. It's at the height of its... It's turning out all this art and building and technology. It fell. God's kingdom is still here. God's kingdom will still be here in another thousand years. Yeah. So what can I do today in my little small actions for Adam Terrell to plant the seeds to grow God's kingdom which will ultimately result in the demise of all earthly governments. And that's by talking about ideas implementing implementing them in my own life being obedient to God evangelizing, teaching others. Yeah. Because I I thought about that too. It's like I would, would severely limit my ability to evangelize share the gospel constantly on the road it wouldn't IRS. it wouldn't <laughs> eliminate it it would just make it incredibly specific you would have a, a prison ministry from the inside yeah. but I'd say that we'd at, at least owe a little bit of taxes since we are voluntarily under like all the ways that they're using taxes no some but. of them are some of them I would personally pay for it if I had the option whether to pay or not, like driving on roads, drive, you know, I would pay I would pay for those things. Yeah. So, some of it, but yeah, it's it gets messy because it's all lumped into a single. Well, the, yeah, the roads deposit that you have for. To I I mean, I don't like taxes in general, but like consumption taxes are less bad in my opinion. Like that's how that's how we pay for our roads through consumption taxes through you know, fuel tax, higher tax. So, you know, at least it has something to do. Like, if you don't own a car, at least you don't have to pay for the roads. You know? But all of our federal income tax, you know, is paying for subsidies and for and it's, well, actually, programs. It's really not, because we're in debt. <laughs> it's not even beginning... Paying into the interest on that debt. We're beginning to pay into the interest on that debt. So the, the $21 yeah. trillion is just the interest on the debt. It's like not even the well, actual debt. Is, right. That's what's due this year. Yeah. The un, the totally un, like the unsecured debt is like sixty or a hundred or one hundred and fifty or something astronomical. I can't even like think of that. But it's just that, that stuff is like just not due time. yet. That debt is just not due yet. It's there. It's on the books. It's contractually obligated, but it's just not hasn't just hasn't understand. fallen due yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to be the um, petrodollar once the other nations of the world secure some other form of currency for oil exchange value of the dollar is done so I was listening to something this morning talking about the fractional reserve banking system because it really doesn't make any sense because like if you go deposit your money at a bank the bank holds 
10% of that, and then the other 90% of it, they lend out to somebody else. But they tell you that you still have full access to your money when you don't. And so this other person has the, has the physical dollars, and they're like, this is my money. And then I'm looking at my bank statement and says, I have $1,000 here. Well, the bank's like, well, actually, you only have a hundred. Well, yes, you do have $1,000 here. And so it's like they're saying that both of you have all of that money when you don't. And Or if, if you both tried to come and take all of your money at once, it's not all there. It's just not. But the bank is saying that it is. Is that not, like, is that not lying? Like, I understand how banking works. Well, there's two forms of banking. Yeah. There's the, I give you my stuff to keep it safe and hold it for me. Banks that just do that, they charge money for that. Yeah. It's a protection service. It's, I'm, I'll hold it for you and keep it safe. It's like store it, a storage yeah. unit. Yeah. Um, the other side of banking is, I'm not, I'm not storing my money here. It's, I'm loaning my money to the bank and they pay me for it. And then the bank turns, so the, my, the bank is basically... They buy my money wholesale and then they sell it retail. They lend it out. Like yeah. if you wanted to buy a house for a million dollars, you don't want to go around to a thousand people and borrow money from a thousand dollars from a thousand people and have to keep track of them. Because then, number one, it's not good for them. Because what if you skip town? They need somebody to go after you, but they're just an individual and it's only a thousand dollars in that time. Yeah. I wouldn't call it lying just because everybody knows that that's not the way it works. And yeah, it does work as long as everybody doesn't have to allow it. So. <laughs> and I just think that it's sort of nonsensical. It's the bank saying that there's tw- there's now 190 percent. Or yeah, you're right because it's you're not forced. Like you voluntarily do that. Sort of thing. I don't think a lot of people understand it, but that just it is yeah, sort of how it works. Lack of knowledge like doesn't justify like call- yeah okay I yeah. but it's just sort of nonsensical. Honey, I and and, and also. Milk? Physical printed dollars, there are more digital dollars sitting in people's bank accounts than are actual physical dollars that exist. Yeah. So as long as people don't ever want to exchange physical pieces of paper, it'll be fine. But what happens if that ever is not the case? Because there's ten times more... Probably more than that. There's ten times more digital dollars that exist than are actual physical dollars, and the physical dollars don't even represent anything physical in and of themselves. Yeah, they're just placeholders for the digital money. So it's 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 all built on trust. And as long as that trust is still there, people have faith that everybody will accept. Will buy me a candy bar. Everybody will accept yeah. this. If if ever that becomes not the case, then yeah, yeah, we have a problem. And it's like, I don't like, I like didn't want to be a prepper for a long time. Cause I thought it was like, I thought I it was I also ridiculous. don't know what would, what would cause that to, to have to occur. What would cause everybody in the United States to say, hey, I don't accept dollars anymore. Well, I don't know what that would be. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think that as much is going to happen. I think that the, you know, the world, the, the dollar of the value is propped up by the world value of the dollar, not the U.S. economy. It's the world economy that holds up the value of the dollar. That's why it has the buying power it has. So whenever we lose status as the world reserve money, and when we lose status as all oil, OPEC or whatever is exchanged in U.S. dollars, value of the U.S. dollar plummets, then people do a run on the banks. Same thing that happened in the 30s to get as much of their money as they can because um, they know that they're going to need it to buy the things that they need to buy to survive. And it, it makes you, well, there's something that I've been learning in business is that value is subjective. Yeah. Yeah. So it's literally just a, an opinion that somebody holds is what determines value. I don't value that water bottle. And as a matter of fact, I probably would negatively value that water bottle because it's got your spit on it. <laughs> But you're not me. That's yeah. subjective. Somebody else, or let's say I'm super thirsty and I'm about to die. It totally depends on my situation and my my yeah. my perception of reality, whether it's accurate yeah. or not. What else could do it is, you know, you see like Warren and all those goons, you know, <laughs> trying to make private health insurance completely illegal, not even the dual system that Europe has. Like completely illegal, that could do it. 
because that means that now I'm slave to the government. I think if the government keeps going and making more and more types of voluntary exchanges illegal, and digital dollars are so easily trackable, yeah. I think it may get to the point to where people are like, I need this and I want to pay for it. The government says I can't. And yeah. if I pay for it in dollars, then it will be tracked and they can find out that I broke the law and I'll go to jail. So therefore, I'm not just not going to use dollars. Yeah. Turn it into some kind of currency. And then the government sees that yeah. and they don't like it. And so they make more things illegal, which just makes it worse. And people will gradually shift to another form of currency. That would probably be what that does could, it. That could happen because, I mean, black market healthcare will happen. It's happening in Europe yeah. right now. Yeah. I mean, it's going to happen in the U.S. Like, I'm not going to. I'll pay a million dollars under the table if I don't die. People have to do that sometimes. Or to get fast care when you need it. Like, you need your knee because you work a construction job. And, you know, you look at, I just got back from, I was in Iceland and Canada for study abroad. I mean, you get good luck. You can wait eight months to a year if that's what you want. But a lot of people are like, I need my knee for my, like, you may not say that it's a critical surgery, but... My family's going to go under if I don't have or a I've, functioning leg. Or I've got an infection, and yeah, it will be dealt with in eight months, but the way that you deal with it when it becomes an emergency is when you have to amputate my leg. Yeah. yeah. Not, I want to have my leg back. Yeah. So it's turned into, I can fix you and fully, you know, the doctor give you your life back versus, yeah. oh, we'll, we'll just keep you from dying, because that's all we can do right now. And I and my parents did not invest this much money into my degree to be paid $30,000 a year. Like, I, I want to do the job for the sake of the job, but, like, there's also the economic incentive, you know? It's like... Rich I would people never, from Canada come to the United States yeah. all the time to get stuff done. Like, they were, like when I was in Iceland, she off, basically offered all of us jobs because we're all nursing majors. She basically offered us all jobs. She's like, oh, yeah, y'all come back here. I'll hire you. Like, if you want to just hit me up, you're, you're hired. And because they had such a nursing shortage because they make... Uh, the before taxes, they make 30, 32000 U.S., and after taxes, they fall in a 36% tax bracket for their income level. So it's all said and done. They're pulling in, like, 19000 U.S. for a four-year degree. Like, it's absurd. And so why did you think y'all would accept? It's like... Ignorance? Uh, yeah, because I don't... I don't no, like, I, I pressed her on that question because she was like, people, all the other... Um, like the girls thought because obviously I think it's beautiful but they're like oh well, I'd love to do that that'd be awesome and then I was like well how much do they make like I think it's a completely socialized system like it's got to somewhere it's got to suffer mm -hmm. and then when you press and you press and you press you know, have you ever read Atlas Shrugged uh -uh. it's a story that basically deals with that the United States goes through basically an entire to save to save the economy uh, but it's all set in older times, but okay. it's like, what if the United States went through an economic meltdown in 1960? Yeah. And it basically, the government coming in and saying, nobody can either lose their job or get a new job or their wages go up or their wages go down. Everything must stay the same for five years. And it's yeah. basically what that happens and everything basically becomes black market because yeah. people die. But you have to still keep paying somebody something because you have to have your expenses have to be the same. It's, it's absurd. I. So it's a really interesting book. I don't like nihilism. I don't like black pill. But man, it's like where do you even go? It's like I, I just don't see how, you know, the phoenix burns out and then the ashes, the new phoenix arises. Like I don't. I'm not as much seeing that as a bad thing now. You know, it's a lot. Of, it's gonna be sad. Like a lot. Of, I think a lot of people. Will Die, There's a political strategy now to where it's yeah. you vote for all the big government programs to exacerbate the problem and make the government yeah, fail. Yeah, accelerationism. I, it terrifies me. That it's, <laughs> you know, it's not completely logical. That's the thing. It's scary. I'm not an accelerationist because there are too many people that I love that will never buy in, um, and I I don't want them to die. You know, and so it's like I will never be on that train, but I can see why they're saying it. Because maybe they don't care about people. Maybe they only care about, you know, personal gain or I their sort political interests. I don't care what happens to the other train because I'm not on it. I'll tell people, hey, this is what's going to happen. Whether it happens sooner or later, it will happen. So jump over to my car. The other I train tried. meeting government, government right now? The government is one train that's going off a cliff. The other train that I want them to jump on is the kingdom of Christ. Yeah. 
because that doesn't that train doesn't derail, and you just keep adding cars on it throughout just, the years. It, 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 people can't. I've had like so many of these conversations with people. They because of the society we live in, with like, Amazon Prime, everything now, everything's so cheap. You know, you can buy a freaking full AR at PSA for like three hundred dollars. Like, everything's so cheap, they cannot imagine a world where this is not reality, when this has only been reality for the last 30 years, you know, so it's like, even my parents, like, it's been brutal trying to get, my dad's like, you know, super outdoorsman, like, and it's been super hard getting them to buy in on, you know, the idea that it's not going to last forever, and I'm not trying to be a freaking doomsday end of the world, I don't think it's the end of the world, but it's like, it's just reality, you know, so. I personally, like, I, I, it may happen, it may not, I don't really care, and I also can't do anything about it, and also, yeah. in that sense, the things that I can't control, I have to trust God for, Yeah. because, like, what if something does happen, like, you know, The Walking Dead, and there are people out there, like, raiding people that have stockpiles, and it's like, if... If enough people got together and decided to go out and steal everybody's food, it's like, there's no way that I could stockpile enough stuff to stop them. I would have to basically gather around a group of people and... Four guys, like, I think four guys, all heavily armed, could hold off a, lar- a very, very large amount of people. Like, more people than you could probably congregate to go attack the house. If you keep it low-key, like... If you if people find out, that's why it's you know opsec's really important. Like if people find out that you have this stuff, then yeah, the word's gonna spread, and that might be true. But if you can keep a low profile for a few weeks, you know you look at any sort of like Venezuelan style economic crisis. If you can keep a low profile and look skinny like the rest of everyone else, I think you can avoid that for a while at least. Or just learn survival skills besides stockpiling. I mean, well, it's cause... easier said than done. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that, and it's, it's it's very hard. Like, I mean, I know how to do like most of the bushcraft stuff through scouts. Like, I did that as a kid, you know. But it's not really sustainable. Like, unless you, you in, really know what in you're North doing. Texas, you better learn how to get used to eating okra. Nothing but okra, because that's all that grows here reliably. Well, I mean, you're not going to be grow like growing stuff is going to be a long time down the road. So it's going to, basically my dad's plan has always been like, go down, to, he's, he's going to go down, because he and his friends go down to South Texas and uh, uh, kayak the Devil's River every year. He's just going to go down there and survive off the land. And I was like, no, you're going to do that then. Well, water's easy, you know, they got plenty of water. You just got to boil it or purify it however you want to do it. Um, there's a decent amount of wood. I mean, it's more sparse than central Texas, north Texas, wood-wise. But there's wood, so you can make fire to boil your water. Um, there's lots of hogs, deer, even, uh, what is it, nigali. It's the uh, animal from India. It looks like a freaking horse, you know. It's like, I guess you could try to survive off that, but it's it's no guarantee. Like, I would love to think that I could just get my freaking bug out bag and go to the woods and be good but the reality is like maybe long term that might be how you do it but short term like we're not going to be able to get out of the city like all the freaking highways are going to be jammed up and you're not going to be able to drive anywhere so it's all going to be on foot mm-hmm. I'm not I don't want to be walking around on foot with all of my gear and all that stuff where I'm just an easy target you know I think bunkering in like, not prepping, like, long-term, but having, like, a few weeks worth of stuff is, like, what you have to do, you know. We're working on that right now, but... <laughs> okay. yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, a couple, oh, like a week ago, the power went out of our house for, like, 36 hours. Oh, wow. wow. And that's the first time that that's happened ever in my life. And yeah. it's just like, hmm, glad I, uh... Got some ice before the power went out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, we lose all our venison. <laughs> Hopefully, the deep freezer can keep it cold enough. Put it open. What were you going to say? I'm just going back to the one about the such were some of you in First Corinthians. You think that is only because there weren't witnesses? 
also, I don't think, I think Rome, Rome, uh, Corinth is in Rome, right? Corinth was in, was under the Roman government. Yes, but it was, I don't think Corinth was in Rome. Like, uh, not, yeah, right, because Rome is the yeah. city, but I mean yeah. Ro- Roman, yeah. Roman rule. Yeah. I don't think that they were allowed to execute people. The Romans sort of took that over, and it's like you have to do civil justice and judges and all that stuff was through Roman rule. But I thought that they could go to the Romans and ask, and then the Romans would approve it sometimes. And it kind of seems like he's saying, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, as if that's the reason. Were those, uh, it was what's listed all capital crimes? Yeah. Says, and nothing else? Well... Sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. So not purely, but mostly. A lot of capital crimes. Yeah. But some not. It says, such were some of you, but you were washed. As if that's why there could still be some of them in Well, and also, to be clear, like the reason that we follow the law is not for salvation. We're already saved, regardless of if we break the law or not. Right. Our attitude has to be repentance and we also affirm that it's good and if we live by it then other people around us will see those people know God because of how they live. I don't know all the details about the laws and stuff and I don't even know who this God is but I know whoever God is these people know yeah. who he is because of how they live and how they act. That's what that's what our obedience to the law is for. It's an evangelism tool. Yeah, but if they were supposed to be stoned then it would say something like and such were some of you, or no, it would say, and such were none of you, because you were stoned. It'd be like, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and then you were stoned. Could be. Could be that some of them had been executed. Could be that some of them didn't have enough witnesses. Could be. Because I imagine, like, I don't think anybody would have a problem saying, okay, you're a thief as a believer, something that you did when you were an unbeliever. You should go pay back what you stole because you're a Christian now. Like, I know I know, believers do that. Do that. Mm-hmm. Hey, I ripped this. I was, uh, well, that's the whole, have you seen Flywheel? Yeah. That's the whole thing. It's like, well, I wasn't living at my faith before, but now I've been convicted of it. I want to go and I want to give you back all the money that I ripped you off. That was Zacchaeus' response. Yeah. Zacchaeus wasn't just pulling a number out of the air and said, hey, I'll restore four times whatever I've defrauded anybody. Well, no, that's what the law says. You steal something and then you sell it to where you don't have it anymore. When you're convicted of a crime, you restore four times. And Jesus didn't say, well, no, Zacchaeus, because I'm about to die and then you'll be cleansed and so you don't have to do it. Yeah. It's... Jesus said, salvation has come to your house, Zacchaeus. You understand salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Because you want to you want to pay the penalty for what you did. So you have to apply that consistently to I would have say that somebody guilty of a capital crime should apply that consistently. Now you may not have witnesses, in which case an execution doesn't happen, in which case that would be that would be God's mercy to that person. So but um, I think that that two to three witnesses, be my does that include that doesn't include yourself. I think it could. Well, I guess you can't. Yeah, you can. But like somebody, somebody saying, "Hey, I killed this person." Well, there's only one witness. I don't think you could execute on that basis of a conf- just a confession and nothing okay. else. But like, if let's say it was like somebody ex gangbanger, like you know, used to kick in doors and steal stuff from people in the hood or whatever, and he and a few of his buddies or whatever used to, and the guy like shot someone stealing drugs or whatever that person becomes a Christian never got caught by the court of law or whatever police um, and now he does have two three witnesses because of people in his gang or whatever that would mean that they would have to come forward mm-hmm. but if they're not believers can they testify in a Christian court of law I would say so it's the judge that has to be. The in. judge has to be a believer, and and a and a believing judge. And I, and actually, I would say that this is the goal: is that our judges should be so good, the same way that the American Arbitration Association works. They do it off their reputation of ruling well in cases. Yeah. And so people voluntarily bring them their matters to solve. 
things I think that'll be resolved. As as believers, we should we should aspire to have that same thing. To where unbelievers say, "Hey, our justice system is crap." These Christians look at the results that they get, look at the problems that they're able to solve and make all the parties happy, and then look at the victim's life afterward. It turns around. Let's go take our cases to him. I believe that that is the entire, in the Old Testament, that's the description of what the new covenant will look like. Yeah. The nations will stream up to Mount Zion, and he will, re- and, and um, God will render decisions for many nations. What about where um, they thought that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had committed adultery because she was found to be with child, and Joseph wanted to put her away quietly. Yeah, it seems like she should have been executed. But it well, says where were the, no where were the witnesses? Just the fact that she had a baby at all. Everybody could see that she had a baby, so that obviously she had committed adultery. But there's no one. What if, um, but if he had brought that accusation out, Mary could have said it was rape. And if in the case of, if in a case of rape, if one of the people is married, you don't put the women woman to death unless you can prove that she was willing in the adultery. And Mary would have denied everything, in which case you don't have a case. So I think that's why he sort of wanted to just quietly let it go. Because he's like, I'm pretty sure, but I can't prove it. That she would, she might say that she, it could it could be rape. But also, now she's not, now she's not a virgin anymore. And so there's de- there was a stigma attached. Well, he could still marry her. Because he was not a priest. Yeah, I would say that he, that he could. But I think there could have just been, there might have just been a stigma on his part. Does that mean that women who are raped now cannot marry believers because the believers are priests? That's an interesting question. I need to look into that. It's like a whole other world. I know. Yeah. Well, and you have to think of the law. I think this is the me, you know. Like I, I thought what I was studying was the me. This is really the me. You know? What you were studying, like it was milk. <laughs> yeah. What were you studying before in the New Testament? Um, well, I mean, I read the I read the Bible cover to cover, and was really um, studying like God's. I focus a lot on first. I stu- I focus like on like the afterlife, what that looks like. Um, then I focused a lot on like God's character because I felt like God was falsely portrayed by so many Christians. It's, like, yeah, love completely and lamb and no lion. Yeah. Um, reading through the Old Testament like really gave me a much fuller understanding of God's character like how much he really hates evil like it's not yeah. oh everything's okay. it's literally no problem striking some like accidentally touched the Ark of the Covenant immediately struck down that's how serious he is mm-hmm. and that's how far gone we are and so that really gave me a better understanding of God's I'm character. reading through I'm listening through the book of Numbers right now yeah. and there are this happens multiple times to where somebody does something that's a capital crime, like he was gathering sticks on the Sabbath, and God's already said, kill everybody that works on the Sabbath. And somebody does it, and then Israel's like, well, let's hold this guy and take him to Moses and then see what God says we should do. They've already been told, but they're like, does God really want us to kill this guy for picking up sticks? And God says, yes, kill him. That's serious. And it's, that happens with somebody working on the Sabbath. That happens with somebody worshiping false gods. Yeah. People are like, is, that, is it really that serious? Like, let's take it to Moses and see what he says. Like, we know that God said execute him, but let's see if there's something that we missed here. Yeah, yeah and then a lot of Christians, or, yeah, I think most Christians right now think that, they're like, yeah, God was all about justice back then. Now he's all about mercy. I mean, he's still about justice, but he's showing a different side of himself or something. But then there's, plenty of verses about even Jesus himself being about justice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jesus was an expert in the law. And he would he would settle entire disputes of his day by referring to the tense of a verb in the Old Testament. And say, you guys are wrong. All you Sadducees that say that there is no resurrection, you guys are wrong. Because God didn't say, I was the God of Jacob. He said, I am the God of Jacob. 
When God said that, Jacob was dead. God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Therefore, you guys are all wrong. Because God said, I am, not I was. Yeah, people just... Like, people... I, it's so often overlooked that... I mean, Jesus could... The fact that he could make the Pharisees and Sadducees look stupid, and these were people that hadn't, like, books of... The, entire books of the Old Testament memorized. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he could just make them look like little children. He was just, making groups of teachers in the synagogue marvel when he was 12 years old. That would be like awesome. a 12-year-old going to <laughs> the highest level PhDs and like freaking Supreme Court Genius. law. And, and asking a simple question and they all go, who is this kid? Yeah, yeah I know. It's, what, what what books have you read? <laughs> Who's your dad? Mar, it's Marvel, you know, and I don't think people... It, it's almost making an, a God in your own image, you know, because so many people haven't read the Old Testament. It, God, you can't have a full encompassing appreciation for God and reverence for God. The New Testament makes no sense. Yeah. Jesus, When Jesus came, he went to the people that knew the law. Yeah. He didn't go to Gentiles. Yeah. He had a few interactions with them here and there. The woman at the well, uh, the, the unbelieving woman that came up to him and asked her to heal her son. Yeah. Asked him to heal her son. But yeah, for the most part, Jesus was talking to a people that had a background, a, a serious background in the law and knew this stuff. Going back to the um, thing about like, do you pay, like, what do you pay taxes and what do you do with rulers that are evil? The Sermon on the Mount, when like turn the other cheek. There are three examples. If somebody tur- slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other. If somebody takes your shirt, give him your cloak. If somebody makes you go with him one mile, go with him two. The reason, what he's speaking to Jews that had an understanding of the law. So let me give you a background about theft. There are three different penalties for theft, depending on the attitude of the thief. The thief steals something, and then he's caught, and he has it in his possession. He gives back what he stole and then he adds an equivalent value to it so that exactly what he had done to the other person is done to him. He made this other person lose a sheep, now he loses a sheep. If the thief steals something and then kills the sheep or sells it and then he's caught, he pays back four. If he steals the sheep and then he feels guilty and then he wants to go and return it he gives the sheep back and then he adds 20% to it so it's a lesser penalty if he turns himself in it encourages repentance so I'm walking down the street it's cold I've got a shirt and a jacket on guy comes up and he says hey I like that shirt give it to me what does he owe me now um, well, it depends how he turns himself in. Like you said, is he caught? Like you call the cops? They let's say, let's say he's caught, um, and he has my shirt. He gives me back. You said so. He's caught. He still has the shirt in mm-hmm. his possession. So he gives you back the shirt. Was it one and a half? Is that what you said? No, double. Double. So he gives you two shirts. Right. A brand that your short shirt and a brand new shirt. I didn't have the shirt. Yeah. So or however I mean, much I paid sense. for it. Yeah. 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 So, what if when he steals my shirt, I give him an additional shirt? Or my my jacket. I don't need two shirts. He's like, thank you? I guess. So now when he's caught, what happens? He gives you back the shirt you already gave him. So at the sense. end of the day, he's not out twenty bucks or, or an extra shirt. Oh, or whatever. I, okay, I understand that. Okay, that's interesting. I never thought of it in. Um, when somebody wrongs me, I see it as an opportunity to pay the penalty on their behalf, so that when God requires it of them at some future date, they have the means to pay it, and they know where they got it from. They got it from their victim. Does that mean you should pay? Double taxes. Then you'll pay sixty percent, at least. Yeah. Is voluntarily it, giving 
Is, is right. that an option? Yes. You can write a check to the Department of Defense. Well, no, 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 not that. But, I mean, is that something that would be within the scope of a righteous attitude for somebody that wants to fix, uh, that wants to pay the penalty that the thief would pay if I didn't? Well, so, what does uh, God an think important that? distinction is... Um, the thief in that example the sure it's an individual the government is a collective it'd be hard to pin it on a single person yeah true like will they all be held accountable every person down to I the also post wouldn't office do it because there is no the per- Secretary of Defense I, I wouldn't do it for taxes because there's no personal connection there's nobody yeah. coming to my house yeah. and also he doesn't he doesn't get that money he's stealing on behalf of somebody else and then well, he gets I, a super duper indirect bureauc- bureaucratic cut of that. Is there? Does they make a distinction between theft and extortion? Because you know you can have theft without extortion, but you can't have extortion without theft. Like someone can extort something from you, but or they can break into your house and take it. Well, extortion them. particularly means that there's a threat of violence involved. Yeah. So taxation is more extortion some, than it is theft. Right. Right. There, um, like somebody can steal something from my house while I'm not there, and I was not threatened with violence, but it was stolen. Yeah. Versus, I'm there and somebody has a gun, and then he steals the stuff. There's so a di- there's a difference. Is there a different biblical penalty for extortion than theft? Because I think of theft more in the sense of like stolen when you had no means of doing anything about it, whereas I obviously tax extortion because you know. There is a case law that's brought up where if somebody breaks into your house at night and you shoot him and kill him, yes. then then he owes then he owes nothing. Like it's it's considered yeah. a wash. Yeah. Um, if if somebody breaks into your house and you shoot him and kill him in the daytime, or let's say that you shoot him and he lives, then he'll be guilty of the theft because it was during the daytime. Yeah. Well, if he's dead, he can't be guilty of it anyway because he's dead. It's a really interesting phrase, and I'm not, and I want to look into it more. But it's, yeah. but the way that it's translated into English is uh, blood guiltiness on his account. And it, there is a difference between whether somebody breaks in at night or during the day. Or it says if the sun has risen on him, then there will be blood guilt for his, on his account. What does blood guilt mean? I, I need to look at it more. <laughs> um, I'm dive into the dictionary. Um, yeah, I wish I, I wish I knew more about Hebrew, but lexicons are helpful. What What about identity theft? Hmm. Like masquerade. Give me a specific example. <laughs> uh, where somebody steals your driver's license and your credit cards and then... So just fraud. So they should owe you back what they stole and owe you an extra identity. <laughs> Well, they hadn't really stolen your identity. They faked. They faked that they were you in order to spend money out of your accounts. Mm-hmm. That would. I would say that's just plain theft. They took money out of your account. They were not allowed to. Sure. It makes it a little bit more complicated today because people use your identity in order to apply for credit yeah. and borrow money in your name. Yeah. Which, if it's discovered, it's like, okay, well, that wasn't me. It's this guy. Okay, so the, now this guy just... What if they can't pay money? for it? You know? Like, obviously, so, but if it's on a level where... What is the... What does the Levitical law say? That if someone's caught and they can't pay the 4X. You sell them for their theft. And slavery, that way that we think of it in American culture, yeah. is not biblical. Slavery. I know it. Yeah, I. Yeah, I know it's. Kid- I had to explain this to people. Kidnapping somebody and then selling them is a capital crime. Yeah. In the Bible. But owing servitude to someone because of your debts or because you were conquered in war is not the same thing. Not even close. Yeah. Right. So the only legitimate form of slavery in the Bible is as payment of a debt of some kind, whether that was criminal through like war stuff. Your society initiated war against us, so we come and we take you slaves, and now you pay off the damages that you did yeah. because your guilt, your whole community is guilty because they went off to war in your name. Or there's a debt that I can't pay. So, and and also all debt in scripture is either as a result of like voluntary borrowing something and then can't pay it back, or straight up evil. 
and those are the only two forms. Of, so either way, it's the person's fault. Yeah. So you pay you pay a debt. There are things where judges are supposed to assign a value to somebody's labor. Okay, you work this many years for you know do this, and then your debt is paid back. Yeah. Or like if you injure somebody, and it takes them a month to recover, and then you compensate them for their time. And if you can't pay for that, then you a judge assigns this much value to your labor. You owe this guy this much because he makes this many dollars per month. Oh yeah. So now you have to work six months because you're not as efficient as that guy would have been. Yeah, he's making sixty dollars an hour. You can only make thirty dollars an hour, so you have to work. Yeah, two months. Yeah. Right. Okay. I guess that Kias should have paid one hundred twenty percent though because he turned himself. In. So why did he pay four times? Which example? Zacchaeus, when he was going to pay back four times what he had t- taken from everybody. Because I think that he probably didn't have that money anymore. He had because he, he was collecting tax money. He had collected too much and then probably spent a lot of it over the course of, of over the course of that time, or given it to whoever. So he didn't have it anymore. Yeah. A lot of the money that he had taken for people, he had spent. But he was also turning himself in, so that should have been 120 percent. Hmm. If you're if you're repentant and you still have the property, then it's 120 percent, I would think. If you don't have the money anymore, it doesn't matter if you're repentant or not. You still owe it back four times. Okay. Anyway, either way, Jesus commended them for it. The other example was when uh, Nathan, the prophet Nathan confronted David over having uh, committing adultery with Bathsheba and then killing Uriah. Uriah, her husband. Nathan says, tells the story of there's a rich neighbor, a rich guy and a poor guy. They both have sheep. The rich guy that has tons of sheep steals the poor guy's sheep and kills it and slaughters it for a, for a guest. So he doesn't have the sheep anymore. And David said, he was super angry, so number one, he said, that man shall die, which I would say, no. But then he said, he shall restore fourfold. He was pulling from the law. That's what you should do, pay back four sheep, because you killed it. And then Nathan said, thou art the man. And then David was repentant at that point. But God still required a fourfold restitution from David. David's four sons died. Another thing, you like God of the Old Testament is justice and mercy, or, or justice and death and punishment. And the new God is a God of mercy. Well, what is mercy? Mercy is somebody still suffering the penalty; it just yeah. being somebody other than the person who yeah. did the wrong. Because yeah. when God showed mercy to David, it's God killed everybody around David. Yeah. Or okay, David, your four sons die, or the child of Bathsheba dies, or. Uh, thousands of Israelites die because of your sin. So what would it look like if somebody stole something and then they got mercy? But mercy would be... The, the, the victim would pay the consequences of it instead. Or or could be a total or stranger. Somebody, somebody stepped else. In and, somebody stepped in and paid the, um, one of your family members or even a random person mm-hmm. at that point could step in. And, okay, so it doesn't matter who... Um, that's like one of the uh, what's it called? It's like sto- not stories, but um, examples that like people give all the time for explaining the sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice. It's like you know the judge steps down and takes the death penalty. Mm-hmm. Whoever's yeah. convicted of it. So it's not just that the penalty just disappears; it's somebody else took it. Yeah. The, somebody. So justice is perfectly upheld. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not saying that the law is bad. It's no, the law is upheld. Yeah. Paul said that we establish the law by our faith. We uphold it. Some translations translate it uphold or establish. Do we then, uh, the phrase, it's like, do we then nullify, nullify the law by our faith? On the contrary, we uphold the law. But back to David's punishment. I thought that just... Like, maybe his other sons died eventually, but I thought that just the son that he was having with Bathsheba was the one to die. That died, yeah. That was 
uh, well, because number one, the number one sin that David did, David did many sins. Like, very early on, he had multiple wives. Um, so, adultery with Bathsheba. Bathsheba also lived because she wrote Psalm 31. Um, so David and Bathsheba both live. They both should have died. So Why should Bathsheba have died? Because it wasn't her choice. Oh, yeah. that's. I'm, I'm not sure if we're told specifically whether she was willing or not. I don't think we are. Probably not, though, because it was David who made her husband die. So, yeah, David was guilty twice over. Once for killing Uriah and once for adultery with Bathsheba. So the child died. I would say that would be a result of the adultery. Uh, Uriah, I don't know. And we're also not specifically told that... Oh, well, maybe it's... Maybe the child died because of because of Uriah, and then David's four sons died because of the adultery with Bathsheba. Yeah. Because in God's eyes, they were still married, because I think a really interesting point is you look at the beginning of the Gospel... Um, going through the genealogy of Jesus and says Solomon son of David um, son of Bathsheba well, or Bathsheba. Bathsheba I think she, she, she's it's a wife she? of um, what was the guy's name again Uriah wife of Uriah it doesn't say Bathsheba it says wife of Uriah hmm. isn't that interesting I heard that on a podcast today actually and I went back and I was like this is either like that's not something that they would just make up like for no reason that has to hold some kind of significance yeah well a lot of those things are all shadows there's a lot of there's a lot of shadows of Christ well even in the construct the construction of uh, the temple under Solomon the construct the way that the construction of the the true temple is happening now is at the hands of Gentiles Solomon built the temple using Gentile labor it's a really interesting shadow Mm -hmm. another thing is that um, when David was crowned king, David is a type of a shadow of Christ. David was not crowned king in Jerusalem. He was crowned king in Hebron. Hebron was a city that was given to Caleb for being a faithful Gentile. So it was a Gentile city. It was a. It was a. No, I wouldn't say it was a Gentile city. But it was a city in the promised land that was given to a gent- that was given to Caleb, which was one of the two faithful spies. Joshua and Caleb were the two yeah. spies. Joshua, which is Je- which is Jesus' name. Jesus' name is Yeshua. Yeshua and Caleb. So you have Caleb was a proselyte, a Gentile that came into the that was grafted into the faith in the old covenant. God said to Caleb. Because you've been faithful, I'm going to give you the city of Hebron, which is in the Promised Land. That's where David, the type of Christ, is crowned king among Gentiles. It's all variety. And then later on, after a period, he that's comes so into crazy. He's going to come into a kingdom built by that's wow. <laughs> that's it's unreal. all there. There are so many. There's so much foreshadowing. So much prediction. It, that you, I would have just never, like, on um, my own devices, been able to make that connection. You know? So that's why you can read through the Bible a million freaking times. Yeah, never see it. <laughs> and that's why, like, the New Testament reveals all of those shadows. But if you don't know, if you don't know what the shadows were, light doesn't mean anything. Yeah. If you're walking into a room that's not dark, you don't need light. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you need to get familiar with the darkness. First, yeah, I'm actually in. Uh, where am I? What are you um, I'm. Uh, I'm in, actually in Joshua right now. So I'll be coming up on that shortly. So. What about the Jubilee laws? The that one was of... specifically told by name that Christ is our Jubilee. Oh, okay. That, I think that's in Hebrews also. Cool. What about? Um, because Jubilee was the, was the sabbatical year of sabbatical years. Every 50th year. 7 times 7 is 49. The 50th year is the Jubilee. Yeah. What about... Um, well, so the New Covenant is about receiving the Spirit and 
the law being in our hearts, and now we can follow the law because the law is spiritual, and now we are also spiritual. We used to be flesh, so it was incompatible, but now. But, so anyways, I was wondering how that, well, Paul in Romans 7 was saying all about how he does what he does not want to do, and that's because... Well, he that's says, the law in his flesh that's still waging war with the spirit. Yeah, he says, I am of the flesh in Romans 7, 14. But now he's supposed to be of the spirit, so why does he say he's of the flesh? Because we still struggle. We still have the flesh with us. So we're both. We're continually being sanctified. Is it because of original sin, kind of off topic, but because of Adam and Eve? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why we have it ingrained into us from birth. It's an inherited, yeah. it's an inherited lawlessness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the only reason that Christ is acceptable to us is because also the sin that we inherited was not something that we did directly. So we can be condemned from something that we didn't indirectly do. That something we can be condemned in Adam because of something that we didn't directly do. We inherited it. Yeah. But if people say, "Well, that's not fair," and I'm like, "Well, salvation also isn't fair yeah. because uh, you can inherit Christ's righteousness that you also didn't take part in." Yeah. That's a really interesting. That's a really interesting verse. Paul is talking about fighting his own flesh, essentially. Who will save me from this body of death? Yeah, I know. And it's so interesting because it's true. You know, it's just a consistent like you literally bear your cross every day, you fight your earthly desires. And even it's cool, the crazy thing that Paul literally echoes that sentiment exactly. Well, and the reason that Paul has so much insight to share is because he was an expert in the Old Testament. Yeah. So it brings so much value to him because now he's like, I see all this stuff because I was so intimately familiar with the Old Testament. Yeah. That's why the New Testament is so earth shattering. Yeah. Yeah. Versus somebody like Peter, he's just sort of a he's a Jew, but he's not he wasn't like a law expert. Yeah. So he has a lot of stuff to say and Jesus taught him a lot, but it didn't hit him like a ton of bricks like it did the Paul. He probably knew more than most of us today though. Still, yes. Because he lived in it in the community that abided by it. Or at least saw that it was good. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I really wanted to stress that in the New Testament the 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 kingdom of God growing well number one it's a mustard seed it's a small seed very small and it grows very slowly And but at the end it's a fully grown tree and it's bigger than all the other trees yeah. and all the birds come and nest in its branches um, also the with uh, in Daniel 2 with Nebuchadnezzar's vision there's the statue that's the head of gold, the yeah. chest of uh, silver uh, does that represent the different empires that collapse? yeah it was um Medo-Persia, Babylon, Greece, and then Rome. Rome, and then the last one, the feet of clay mixed with iron was sort of a weakened Rome. Yeah. And then a stone came and crushed that statue, and then that stone grew into a mountain that filled the whole earth. And that stone was Christ. And the Christ, mm-hmm, Christ was sacrificed on uh, in Zion, and we're told that all the nations will stream to Zion to be given to, to uh, be judged and it's have not, cases. Not, it's not physical. That's Jesus's embodiment of. It will have, have, have yeah. cases be decided by Christ, and we are Christ's body on earth. So I think that's the next. That's that will be the the end. The end goal of the kingdom is to have, is to be seen as so righteous by everybody around us that they will come to us and say, "Will you please rule us?" Yeah. Will you please kill me and stone me? Will you please decide my cases for me? Because we we know not the day nor the hour, but I mean, I, I think it's a long way off. I really do. I, do like, too. I realize how much work has to be done. So, as much as I wish that I think it would be, I would love nothing more than to be, you know, standing here right now whenever Jesus returns. I just think realistically, like, that's not going to happen. What does it mean in Galatians 4 where it says, um, 
How is it that you turn back again to the weekend with those elemental things? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I was wondering what that meant, the days and months and seasons and years. Read the first part of that again. But now that you have come back to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. Who is he speaking to at that point? The Galatians. Wasn't the thing of the Galatians, they had basically been duped by Judaizers? Yeah. Saying that in order to be saved you must keep all of these things. So I think that's what Paul's talking to. I was just wondering what specifically the days and months and seasons and years I would say that would be like feasts and Sabbaths and all that stuff. Because the Galatians were turning back to those things, saying that you have to do this to be saved. Mm-hmm. You have to do this to be in the faith, and if you don't, then you're not, then you're not in the faith. And they, they were starting to turn back to those things. I was wondering if it was Jubilee, or if it was... Sounds like he's just saying all, all, all that stuff. Yeah. Days and months and seasons and years. Um, I was wondering, I read through... In Jeremiah 33, this is, this is a description of the New Covenant, starting in verse 14. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, New Covenant, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, that branch is Christ, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings and to burn grain offerings and to make sacrifices forever. So Christ is our burning sacrifice. That's right now. Like how it says, he shall execute justice on the earth. And then also Isaiah 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow into it, and many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I think that is in in process right now. Where is that in reference to judgment? Like, Yeah, so you think that we're in that process? We're in that process right now. Yeah. People are still learning more, as far as I know. (laughs) Myself included. Yeah. Then another prophecy about Jesus bringing justice is Isaiah 42. The coastlands wait for his law. Yeah, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. Then later he will faithfully, faithfully bring forth justice. Then later... He will not be disheartened until he has established justice. And the person is prison. That would be another... I would love to go through Revelation. Because I think that would be, that would be a whole other thing. Um, I, I would recommend a book... Because I've mapped it out, and I have a general overview of all the different things that occur, but there's so many different theories and so many different interpretations of what it means. Kenneth Gentry. Read any of his books on Revelation. I still need to read some more books on it, of, of his material. But uh, his, his overview makes the most sense to me. I believe that Revelation all the way up through to chapter 20 has already happened. The last two chapters of Revelation are still future. But I'm a post-millennialist. I'm not a dispensationalist or like pre, pre, post-trib, all that stuff. Like, I'm a different category. I'm really? post-millennial. Okay. So I believe that Christ will come back after the gospel has won on earth. Okay, that's interesting. So you, wait. 
So the vast majority of so people you think will the seals either have been open, if, the trumpets have been. You think all that stuff's happened? Um, there may still be some that are in. I, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think so. Um, wow. Okay. There's I've a. Never heard there are some before. seals. There are some seals that we're told of in Daniel, that says, "Seal this book up," because it's not for a long time to pass, and that long time to pass, seal the book up because this prophecy is not for yet. 400 years later, that prophecy was fulfilled. In Revelation, we're told, don't seal this book up because these things are shortly to pass. And it's been, people that say that it hasn't happened yet, it's been 2,000 years. So why in Daniel, when we're told, seal it up because it's 400 years away, but in Revelation, don't seal it up because it's about to come to pass, that's 2,000 years. And what was the one that was sealed up that already came to pass? Daniel. In the book of Daniel. What in the book of Daniel? Um, maybe it, maybe Daniel or Ezekiel. There's a there's a scroll. Because all seven seals are broken before chapter twenty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just I would have to do yeah, a Daniel, serious study of that. Daniel chapter so. twelve, verse four. But you, Daniel, shut up these words and seal the book until the time of the end. Okay, so that also the trumpets too. So the first, so you look here at the first four trumpets. Um, so the third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and the springs of water. Named the star of wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from waters that had become bitter. What is that? I believe that that's all. Uh, and. Kenneth Gentry has done a lot more study into it than I have, okay. uh, and I would refer to some of his to some of his works. Yeah. Um, my my guess is that that's referring to uh, when Israel was destroyed a generation after Christ died. Yeah, and they destroyed the temple. They destroyed the temple, destroyed Israel, and I believe that of uh, like many, many, many people died. Many Jews died. Probably so a, third. a third. That says a third. A third of the rivers. So that's not necessarily. I always thought of it because of I. I kind of was more of a um, post-trib rapture. It's kind of where I fell in the category. Of. I always assumed this was referring to the whole world. You know, like so. I was like, there's no way that's happened. That was, it hasn't happened in the entire world. Yeah. And, uh, there's just so much. Read Kenneth Gentry's books. I'm, I will. I am poorly I'll, equipped to answer those questions. No, I, and I understand. It's a very, very, very complicated topic. This is the toughest of It's still kind of complicated, but Kenneth Gentry makes it a lot less complicated okay. than most I'll, people do. I'll read that, because there's a lot of, with Revelation too, there's a lot of... Matthew, Matthew 24 uh, is the whole thing about, like, this generation will not pass away until you see all these things take place. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famine, nations. All that stuff. I believe all that stuff actually did happen within a generation of when Jesus said it. I mean, yeah, all of those have occurred throughout. Well, like the sun will not give its light and the stars will fail to shine. Those are all, that's all poetic language, apocalyptic language that even David used. Like, there's a part where uh, David describes his victory over Saul. And he uses the, that type of apocalyptic language. But I, I like always stars like fell the, from the sky, the, the the sun went dark, and all of a sudden, like you go and you read back of the actual historical account of like none of that stuff happened. Right. David's so waxing right. poetic and eloquent in describing all that stuff to describe, his, you know, ascribing this all to the mighty hand of God. So you don't think it's like because obviously we've seen like because I follow different people that have interpretations of Revelation. And you look at like the increase in pestilences, increase in, increase in earthquakes. Like you can just see throughout time the frequency and intensity of the earthquakes steadily rising as the years pass where we're getting extremely frequent high magnitude earthquakes now that have not occurred in previous years. So, like, As far as I know, um, dispensationalist scholars say that, yeah, all that stuff is fascinating and that may be the case, but it doesn't mean one way or another that Christ is coming back because they, they would agree that all of the signs that have to happen before Christ's return already happened. So there's no further signs that we're waiting for before Christ returns. But you thought it was only poetic? 
that he was talking about? In Revelation, it's super symbolic and poetic. Yeah. And, stuff. and it's examples of yeah. David used the same type of language when he was describing events that happened in his life. But did you say you thought it was poetic only and not literal? When David was saying it? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Stars didn't fall from the sky. Because we have a historical account of when David uh, had dealings with Saul. And we weren't told that the, that the day turned to night and those types of things. So in that case, if only, so everything up to chapter 20. Yeah, there's a transition. Yeah. And I think it's maybe the end of chapter 19. So what about the thousand, thousand years? I believe that we're in that right now. We're in the thousand years. Or the millennial reign of Christ on earth. Yeah, and I, I believe that Satan is gone now. Satan has been cast into the pit for, for this period right now, so Satan is bound. You don't think that Satan is still walking? Yeah, I think they were like six He's he has been bound. I don't know if that means walking the earth or not, but he has been his his power has been greatly diminished. Why do you think that? I don't know. Yeah, because of Christ's sacrifice of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the Holy Spirit before, except in very select circumstances. It seems like evil is only becoming more prevalent. Like have you I, looked at crime rates in the United States? Well, I'm totally. I'm, I'm looking at. They're going down. I'm not saying our specific country. I'm talking about comparing centuries. Like the 20th century was the bloodiest century in the history of man. Oh yeah. Killed. I'm not not saying that you won't have ups and downs. Yeah. But I'm saying as a whole, this is an ancient realm. So you think he was bound? Right as soon as Jesus died? As Yeah, at his resurrection, Satan was bound. But if that started the thousand years, it's already been two thousand years. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he wants you to Also, like demons, like I, like demons absolutely still roam the earth. Oh, sure. So because Satan was bound, like that, I guess, yeah, that all the demons hadn't been cast. <laughs> like, yeah, we hold the side oh, yeah. cast. And so I've never heard that perspective. So what does it say in Revelation happens after the thousand years? And has that happened? When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, God, battles of Gog and Magog. Um, the number they would like to stand on the seashore, they march across the bread of the earth and surround the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But the fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, which the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They were tormented day and night until the end of the age. Um, when I finally saw the white throne, it was sitting on the earth, and the heavens fled from his presence. There's no place for them. Um, anyone who's, this is judgment day, like, anyone whose name has not been written in the book of life shall be cast into again. So... You think that Satan is deceiving four corners of the earth right now and are about to have the battle of Gog? No, he's be, he's still bound right now. But I thought he was only he bound for released. a thousand years. He hasn't been released. He's, he's released at the end of the thousand years. But it's been that, more than a thousand years. Because that kingdom, that thousand years is a poetic... I think it's actually a thousand, like a thousand years. It's a, it's a time period. Why it's just a thousand it's years, why would it be poetic? Because it's in Revelation, for one. No, I understand the, the poetism, but there's also like specificities that it points out. Like not everything is like obviously like I like when Jesus comes riding in, like he won't maybe he will have a literal sword coming out of his mouth. I don't think that's the case. But that also doesn't mean that Jesus like is poetically riding in and he's not riding in. Like I believe that he will be riding in. But it you know, so there are parts of it that There's I, also some other passages about, like, you know, we'll be caught up in the air with him and moving together in the clouds and that type of stuff. Like, I'm not exactly sure. It's like, yeah, and the dead in, the dead in Christ have to rise and we will be granted our eternal bodies. Like yeah. that, Is I don't, that at the new heavens and the new earth? <laughs> at the sound of the last trumpet? That's why I don't think it's, ha it's happened yet. Because then all of us who are alive in Christ would have been taken up into the clouds and we would be granted our eternal bodies, which I, I don't have an eternal body. There's, more, there's a lot of symbology in this in the feasts and, and Sabbath days, like the Feast of Trumpets. Like, what's the significance of trumpets? I don't really know because I'm not really familiar with the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Tabernacles. There's a lot of symbology that's being used there that would be very significant to somebody that's, that's familiar with those feasts. Yeah. 
and the little bit that I've looked into it, it's like, wow, there's a lot of meaning here that I don't know, that I didn't understand before, and I know that there's a lot more to go into. But I don't see your reasons for thinking that the thousand years is symbolic. Like, read Kenneth Jeffrey's book. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I respect that because it's just such a rich. It's a lot, and it really doesn't have that much practical bearing on my daily life. Yeah, it's more how I, I, I look into it because people know that I'm really into this stuff, so I get asked it all by like my friends who are believers because they know I'm into digging into the scripture, and I don't have good answers a lot of times, like because a lot of, um, because like I personally believe what's written in the scripture is that when we die, we reside in Sheol until either you are resurrected and granted your eternal body, or you're resurrected on the judgment day, which your name is the white chocolate life and you're cast into Gehenna. So like, having to explain that to people who believe, like, right exactly when you die, like, and that, that's all bearing on this, like, right exactly when you die, what happens. I happen to take it because I think you're dead until you're resurrected. Whereas some people think immediately the second you die, you're dead have your hell, which I don't know. To be absent of the body to be present with the Lord. It's just so it's like I don't I, I don't want to leave people astray. That's my study, like that's what I conclusion of the issue. But from dust you have come, to dust you shall return and your spirit shall return. life breathed into the dust body, like it's, it's the spirit, your consciousness, like it's the spirit, simply what makes you human, you know? and the body is just the body. So I just, I don't want to lead people astray, and lead people, that's why, I, you know, the milk and the meat is so funny, it's like I, I don't want to get in these conversations with people that are still wrestling, and debating on what are their solidified crowds, like they really... Are they really believers? As long as you're aspiring to get more into the meat, everybody's everybody's at a different maturity level. As long as you're as long as you're growing, you're fine. But if you see you know a 30 year old person that's this tall, you know there's an issue. If, if you're if you've been a believer for you know 20 or 30 years and you look the same as when you did when you were a believer, you're one. There's, there's a problem there. Yeah. That's not normal. Um, the end of Hebrews 5 going into chapter 6 it talks about like, how and I don't know when you need to yeah I, I, I probably need to I need to I should have left like this but it's basically saying you need to be aspiring to meet you need to you're, you need to be aspiring to leaving behind the basic things yeah. and like you've got those that's the ABCs yeah you need them but you don't need to spend hours studying them anymore you've got it um by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God you need milk not solid food for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child solid food is for the mature for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity and here's, here are the things that you need to leave behind Laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. You've got that. That's like step one of being a Christian. Yeah. That's, yeah, being born is necessary. But you were born now. You're not a baby anymore. This is how you move on. Laying uh, instruction about washings, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and internal judgment. These are all basic elementary things that you, when you, your goal is to progress past that. So, that's an encouragement, I think, yeah. to all of us. Yeah. And I, I've seen that progression. Um, I've definitely seen that progression. And i, I got to remember, too, that it's like people grow at different rates. Uh, I just jumped into it really fast. Like, I probably shouldn't have, but like... Why not? Six, within six months of... Well, fall. if you go too fast, you could be unsustainable and don't have solid roots and just get blown away. Yeah, that's the thing. It's luckily, I've seen that happen. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, I had a really good base. Oh. Like, held me down because I want to know all the answers. Like, all right, I'm dedicated. Let's have every, every question answered. Yeah, just like, make sure that your knowledge doesn't outpace your wisdom. 
Because if you think you know too much stuff, but you don't have the wisdom to go with it, you can do some really stupid stuff. Yeah. End up like Bill Clinton. Super smart guy. Make all the wrong decisions in life. Yeah. Said he had a no connection with Epstein. So now that picture of him and that chick is so yeah. on the plane. So. Why do you think it says in Colossians, um, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. What do you think that's referring to? <laughs> oh, I think he's referring do not handle, do not taste, do not touch is referring to clean and unclean things. Okay. Like foods that you're not supposed to, don't touch a dead animal, don't touch an unclean body, uh, don't eat unclean foods. We know those things are fulfilled in Christ. Christ has made us clean because those those things were all for being clean for purposes of offering sacrifices in the temple. Christ has made us clean, so now we're able to offer ourselves as clean, acceptable sacrifices in the temple today. But not everything was made clean or was unclean. Such as? Like the crimes. Because it... Oh, that's not to do with ceremonially. Like, if you steal something, you're not ceremonially unclean. Yeah, but it still talks about you being unclean. If you do it, well, not ceremonial. Well, your heart can be unclean. Yeah. For sure. But I think there's a difference in the picture there between... I got a roll. Can I get both of yeah. y'all's numbers just so, like, y'all can text me whenever y'all want to do something like this again? It's very eye-opening. Yeah, it's really good conversations. I've always wished that there could be conversations like this, but then, like, the only thing I've seen is, like, men's, men's theological studies. Well, that yeah, is and they don't talk about any of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'll ask my pastor. He, he can read and speak... Uh, Koine, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Oh my gosh. And I'll ask him some of these questions, and he just sort of goes, he just sort of purses his lips like, those are excellent questions, very meaningful, and I've never had anybody ask them to me, and I don't know what the answers are or how to begin to find the answers to those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's I'm hard. Like, it's really you, hard. You've translated the New Testament for yourself. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, uh, and he'll be like, and he'll say something in passing, and I always jump on those opportunities. Yeah. Like um, he's like, yeah, in the Old Testament, if some if a woman was raped, she was obligated, unless the father forbid it, to marry her, to marry the person that raped her. And I'm like, well, except in, in case that he stole her away, in which case that would be kidnapping, and that's capital crime, right? And he goes. <laughs> That's a really good point, and like the but then the conversation dies; it never goes any further. Yeah, and I'm like, what do you? That's think the that beginning is? of a conversation. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't. Yeah. Okay, I need to go. But okay, well, I can't get looped into that. Again. <laughs> I'll be here for another freaking two hours, <laughs> and then my buddy will get mad that I didn't. Hey, good to meet you, dude. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Great to meet you all. I'll uh, hopefully see y'all. Okay, sounds good. Okay, I need lunch. <laughs>